Now I'm going to teach you a little trick. When you say I'm excited, your brain tells your body you're safe. And so they studied this at Harvard Medical School. If you, in a moment like this, go five, four, three, two, one to interrupt the racing, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then you say, I'm so excited to be up here. I'm really excited, even though I'm, I'm like shaking. I'm really excited <laughs> because my colleagues believe in me. I'm really excited and I'm really proud of myself. Something is going to happen in your body, so I want you to repeat that with me, okay? You ready? I'm really excited to be up here. I'm really excited to be up here. Let's do it a little louder. I'm really excited to be up here. I'm really proud of myself. I'm really proud of myself. I'm really excited that my colleagues love me so much. I'm really excited that my colleagues love me so much. And I'm really excited I'm pushing through my fears. I'm really excited I'm pushing through my fears. Do you feel your body settling a little? Even just a little? No. <laughs> no? Not at all? I don't believe you. I think that you think if you say, I actually feel a little bit better, Mel, that I'm gonna make you stay up here longer. Isn't it? See? I knew it! I knew it! How many of you feel for her and you know fear is holding you back too? Fear lowers when you move. I wanna hear you say, I'm excited I'm up here because I know deep down in your heart you are. I'm excited to be up here. Why are you proud of yourself for allowing yourself to come up here? Because I'm awesome. Yes! Yes! Yes, you are! You are! Yes, you are! I want you to take this in. Take this in. You are awesome. What did you get out of this, other than hating Mel Robbins? I'm gonna get my boss. <laughs> She deserves a promotion. I want to raise on Monday morning. That's 10. Huh? What did you get out of this? Um, it's not so bad to be seen. Oh, man. That's deep. That's deep. It's a beautiful thing to allow yourself to be seen. And too many of us, because of whatever's happened to you, whatever you've survived, because it scares the hell out of you, we won't even allow ourselves to be seen. It makes me so sad. It really does. And so I hope that in your bones and your nerves and your cells, this is a line in the sand, a before and an after. And when you catch yourself opting out or hiding, that you remember this moment and you choose to be seen and to show up for yourself because you are freaking awesome. They see the women at that table that pointed at you and pointed at you they see what you see. You are awesome. You got it? Good. I can't believe I can't remember the gentleman's name. He's, an, he's from Washington, D.C., and it was a show about heroin mm. and heroin addiction, or the opioid addiction and heroin, and how this has been an epidemic in the black community for 20 years. And it only became a big national story because opioid addiction got linked to heroin abuse and it became a white problem. Mm -hmm. And so he came on the show with three former addicts. It was the most profound show that I have ever done because I learned something that I never even understood 
as a public defender. And that is living in poverty and living with systematic racism creates trauma. Hmm. And when people experience trauma in their bodies and in their nervous systems, your response, particularly if you have no resources or treatment, and the vast majority of us do not get treatment for the trauma that we experience, most of us want to numb it. Mm -hmm. And he connected the dots between the chronic trauma that the folks that he was serving had experienced growing up in extreme poverty in among you know around violence dealing with racism and bigotry and violence and the natural inclination to reach for something to help you numb that pain mm -hmm. and he connected the dots between deep emotional trauma and addictions that result in a way that I had never heard anybody explain so eloquently. And it was such an eye-opening experience. Mm. How do you think we heal trauma if we don't have the resources to go to therapy or do workshops or whatever it may be? Even if we do have resources, we don't have the right. courage to put ourselves out there. How do we start to heal trauma within our body? Excellent question. So uh, we did a whole uh, project for Audible Original um, called Take Control. That was all about, the thesis was this, any area of your life that you're stuck, I am willing to bet everything I have that you have a trauma pattern from your past that you've never healed. Mm -hmm. um, you got a boss that is abusive, guarantee you, this has to do with a trauma pattern from your past. You can't succeed in the areas you want. You can't lose the weight. There's some pattern from your past. So the first thing is recognizing that you actually experience trauma. And I am a huge proponent, as so many people are, of widening the definition because I think yeah. up until about five years ago, most of us thought that trauma just meant, okay, you uh, were in active duty, Mm -hmm. or you were in a huge accident or incident that was highly traumatic, or you survived some sort of uh, physical, sexual, whatever abuse. Trauma is just about any kind of experience that you witness or you absorb that has your nervous system light up on edge and start warning you. So if you've ever had, if you, like you could have a critical parent and you just brace for them. You could have a, a parent that, that drinks like crazy and you brace at five o'clock because you know they're coming home. You could have been abandoned by a parent or have a parent that was mentally ill or have a parent that was so on your ass because they wanted you to be a pro football player. Mm -hmm. And so you were constantly on edge. It's when your nervous system fires up to a state of alert that now gets programmed into your body as a response. There's a reason why so many couples at five o'clock at night start bickering. And it has to do with the fact that at five o'clock is typically when a lot of parents 20 years ago were coming home from work. And that's when the arguing would start. And so what happens when you witness that or you feel it is as a kid, you're now in a state or you're on edge. Wow. I see you rocking in your chair. Wow, that's crazy. Well, I mean, I just remember, you know, it's funny. We, there's, a, there's a lot of good things that usually happen to our, our childhood, but we just seem to remember a lot of the bad stuff. And it's because it's- You know why, right? Because the trauma just like in your nervous yeah. system, I guess. And also your mind is wired in a way to prioritize the negative as a means to keep your ass safe to protect from not yeah. experience it. Correct. Which so, is why you got to work yeah. on your positive mindset because your mind defaults to negative. So you got to build up the programming to positive. Exactly. This isn't just woo woo. This is actually science. People. I know. So I, I remember, you know, my, the memories of the past, I always have to remind myself of all the positive stuff that, you know, my parents did all the time and what they were going through and giving them grace and all these different things. But I remember, you know, when my dad would get home, it would be, it was, you didn't know what type of day it was going to be for him. You know, it was like either a thunder coming through the, the wooden floors with his wooden shoes and like being angry and upset, or it was like the loving father that would take me out and play catch in the backyard. So I have to 
constantly remind myself of like the positive, which I'm, I'm certain it was 90% of the time was good, but yeah. those 10% of the time, you know, creates that clinching mode, like you said. Well, let me explain what happened. So there's really interesting concept called ghosts in the nursery. And so trauma patterns get automated in, because they're not experienced in your brain. They're felt in your nervous system. Mm. And so it's why you can have a pattern from your past, but be completely unaware that it's running your life right now because it's stored not in your conscious thought, but in your nervous system. And you feel it in your body before it even gets into your head. And so from, there's this concept called ghost in the nursery, which basically means there's all kinds of that goes on when you're little that you may or may not remember in your mind, but your body remembers it. So for example, if you had parents that were just stressed out and they come home and they've been busy and you're sitting there playing on the floor and there's, there's toys everywhere and mom or dad's reaction to a mess is to scream, that creates this kind of thing in your nervous system. Now you may not remember that episode that happened on May 17th, 1972, but your nervous system remembers what it's like. So fast forward, you're now 51 years old and you walk in the house and there's a mess everywhere. And even though you have said, I'm not gonna bulldoze and yell at anybody, my body recognizes the situation. So what do you do? You repeat the pattern you saw. And so what I'm working on right now is a pattern that is encoded in my nervous system. I was trying to create a video yes or two days ago um, for share the mic, for share the mic now. Yeah. Um, trying to create a video and I'm like doing take after take because I want to get it right. And my daughter comes waltzing into the room and was like, how long are you going to be doing this? And I was like, can't you say that I'm working? I literally like <laughs> screamed at her. And she looked at me, Lewis, and she goes, you have a real problem. Wow. How old is your daughter? 20. And I said, I, I calmly said, you're right. I do. When I get interrupted, mm -hmm. I lose control of the response and I'm working so hard and the way that you, and I'm clearly not mastering this yet, but the way that you do it is as you feel it rise up, you have to, you know, you can use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one. You can use, just take a quick breath. You can notice the pattern and you've got to create a pause between the emotion rising up and the reaction that gets automated. And for many people, the reaction, Lewis, is to run away. It's to leave the room. Mm -hmm. It's to avoid the confrontation. The, it was just easy, you know, oh, hold on, let me let the clock go. <laughs> Even though you, um, you hate being interrupted by anything, <laughs> this is a great interruption. See, I, I did, like I didn't do, I didn't do the bulldoze. <laughs> I, was, I was calm, because it wasn't a human being. I'm only mean to human <laughs> beings. Um, I know like I, a lot of people run away. They yeah. avoid conflict. They say it's just easier, but if running away and avoiding conflict continues to create a pattern where you feel invisible and your boundaries are tromped on, mm. that's a pattern. And you know, here's the other thing about patterns, running away and being quiet might've saved you when you were little, because if you were quiet and out of the room, you didn't get hit. You didn't get yelled at. You were out of harm's way. So when you were little, it was a genius pattern because it protected you. But the issue for adults is that, again, we walk around with the patterns that we created when we were eight years old in different situations than we are in now. And now yeah. we are completely a robot to these patterns. Here's the crazy thing about the fear of failure, okay? The reason why most people fail is because they're afraid of failing. Your fear is making you do the thing you're most afraid of. You fail because you don't try. I mean, it's like crazy. I hope that this is hitting you like a punch in the gut, that it's actually the fear of failing that makes you feel like a failure. And the solution is really simple. You have to push through it because you're never gonna get what you want in life if you don't learn how to push yourself outside your comfort zone. And you know, the, the, the major problem I think with failure is that way too many of you think that you're supposed to achieve your dreams. You're supposed to achieve uh, your goals. And the truth is what has always happened for me is that my dreams and goals that I set 
have always led me to something else that I wasn't even thinking about. They led me to something that I was destined and designed to discover. None of which ever felt right. And none of those things were actually very successful. You know, I mean, ultimately Monster in Laws was canceled. The show I shot with Fox never aired. That's not successful. What I learned in those projects led me to being able when the moment came to meet the moment. Discover what you're looking for when you're willing to hear what's in your heart, when you have the clarity to do that, and when you have the courage to pursue it. And it may not turn out how you like. It may not be the blockbuster that you thought it would. But when you listen to your heart and you keep moving forward, you get rewarded and you also get the lessons that you need. You can't fail at your dreams because they're meant to be pursued, not achieved. You didn't fail at them. You've tried a bunch of different things that didn't work yet. That's it. And you gained experience. One of the things that I find really interesting is that when you have big dreams, sometimes the scariest moment is when you say them out loud. So what you're present to is not your dreams, you're present to failure. Like part of the problem for, for you in really fully realizing and expressing what you want is that the second that you say you want to change, you're present to it not happening. And that's a pattern that we have to break. If you put in the work, you can make your dreams happen. Dreams are personal, so are the obstacles. If you stay in a mindset where you're present to failure, every day is gonna be about starting. And the obstacle that's in your way is the thinking pattern of being afraid of failure. It's also the fear of uncertainty that you're dealing with. The uncertainty of what happens if everything doesn't go according to plan. The thing is, is it never goes away. If you're about to do something for the first time, chances are high that you might embarrass yourself. But what it means is if you're willing to be the kind of person that is willing to embarrass themselves, it means you're trying something new. It means you're going for it when everybody else sits on the sidelines. So before you give up, the only thing that matters is the work that you're putting in, not the end result. Anyone who is truly successful did one thing, and it's the same thing that we all do. They put in the work. Will you fail along the way? Of course. And you know what? I hope so. That when you fail once, you double your chances of success. Failure doesn't make you give up. Failure happens when you give up. All I want you to ever do is try. I just want you to try in those moments where you hear yourself, I want you to try. In those moments where you know that it's time to speak up, I want you to try. That's all that I ever ask of you because if you simply do that, and I say simply as if it's so easy, right? You will literally unlock the potential of your life. The difference between reacting and responding, uh, even bringing back what we talked about, you know, having an argument, you know, losing someone, uh, reaching out to someone, your own personal feelings. I think people get the difference between a reaction and a response completely mixed up. And I just, I've always wanted to talk to you about this because I have my own way of thinking, but you sometimes have like a deeper way of thinking about it. So I just wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts? So a reaction is when your emotions do the talking. A response is when your heart and your values and your truth do the talking. And what do you say to someone like me who is an emotional person? Because emotional uh -huh. people, and I'm an emotional person from dealing with my sexual abuse, right? Like I've had some, like there's some triggers that happen emotionally. Uh -huh. Like how do you help someone like me who the first thing I want to do is have an emotional response to something or reaction to something when, like how do I dive into that? response instead of the emotional reaction. So um, I'm going to try to explain this in a really simple way. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to. Don't. I don't. So I say you. Being, <laughs> being somebody that, that has uh, sexual abuse in my past, being a survivor, um, a lot of times when we use the word emotion, what you're talking about is your nervous system gets fired up, and then your body floods 
with all kinds of feelings before your mind is even there. So your body, Sean, is picking up clues before your mind even knows what's going on. And I did not make this up. They've proven this through research. So for example, there was a a famous study done where they put two decks of cards in front of people and the decks are completely rigged. And basically they scientists wire you up and they start flipping over cards and it's very clear kind of which deck is going to be the winner. I I can't remember like how that, what the rules are, but you're trying to figure out which deck is the better deck and your body starts to respond to the deck that is the better deck 20 cards before your brain picks it. And the reason why that's true Hmm. is that our bodies are machines that read rooms and feel situations. And there is so much programming that has gone on in your body. I call it patterns. Some psychologists call it trauma patterns or are the trauma response. Some people call it I'm emotional or I get triggered. All that you're talking about are patterns that have you react before your mind has even figured out what's going on. And so I can give you another example. So there's a, there's a concept in psychology called ghost in the nursery. Hmm. Ghost in the nursery means that from zero to five, your brain is in a state. So your boys' brains are in a state right now like sponges. They are absorbing everything at like a hundred X the way that you and I can absorb things. It's why toddlers can become bilingual like that because their brains are in a state of absorbing everything around them so they can learn language, so they can become more independent, so that they can walk, so that they can read social cues, so that they can communicate. And what happens during that time is there's all kinds of stuff that's going in here that makes no sense to a baby's brain, but it's also going into your nervous system. So, for example, if you're three years old and mom or dad comes home and they're stressed out and they see toys everywhere and they immediately start yelling at their partner, you as a baby don't remember that situation up here, but your body does. Mm. Because when dad starts yelling or dad gets tense, your sons already know when that's happening, don't they? Their bodies are absorbing these experiences. So fast forward to being 40 years old. You could walk into the house, Sean, and be the most calm, cool, collected guy on the planet, but you see a very chaotic scene. Your body remembers, oh, this was when my caregiver yelled. And then you automatically find yourself getting emotional. Because and, and you're yelling and you don't understand why. That is a pattern that has been absorbed in your nervous system. Your nervous system, re- oh, I remember this. Oh, and I remember what the adults do. They yell when it's messy like this. So you can say, Sean, up here, I got to be calmer when I go home. I got to start speaking up at work. You can say whatever behavior change you want. But what's going to get in the way of you doing it in the moment when you're riled up is the part of the brain that you and I talk about, uh, the part of the brain that we're using when we talk about wanting to change is a totally different part that's in control when you get emotional. So you're dealing with patterns and the only way to change a pattern. So here's the good news. There's nothing about anybody that's broken. You just have a pattern that's broken from the past. Mm. That's it. Just doesn't work anymore doesn't work. It may work in some situations to get emotional. Great. Keep doing it. But in situations where your emotional pattern is keeping you from getting what you want, that's where you need to learn how to spot it, break it, and put in something else. So here's how you do it. It's very, very simple. You just develop a practice of putting yourself in pause. So as you feel like, what's it feel like for you when you're about to get emotional in a situation you don't want to get emotional in? Oh. Where do you feel in your body first? 
such a good question. I get, I just get hot. Okay. Like I just yeah. get hot. Like I don't feel like my heart beats any faster, but, and it's not like my palms and my feet sweat necessarily. Like yeah. I just yeah. start getting hot. And Scott says that my eyes get really big. He's like, your eyes get really big and it's scary. And I'm like, really? I don't feel my eyes opening, but I feel, I feel hot. Like, I'm just like, oh, my goodness. Like, that's... Okay, yeah. terrific. So you know the body trigger. That happens before your mind realizes that this is about to go south. So what you want to do is whenever you get hot, you want to be able to put yourself in pause, mm. which means step out of the pattern. Oh, here comes that trigger. I'm getting super hot. Maybe you come up with a code word with Scott. I'm getting that hot feeling again. And that's your code to take two deep breaths. Or that's your code to say, I'm going to calm myself down right now. Or that's your code to say something else. Because you're going to put yourself in pause instead of allowing yourself to get emotional. That's the work right there. That's it. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to distance yourself from the trigger of getting hot and the reaction right now, which is you get hot, you start doing whatever you do. You get emotional. You want to get hot and go, oh, I'm getting hot and create a moment of pause because it's in this moment of pause, Sean, that now you're back in control and you can choose how you're going to respond. And look, this is a lifelong process. So today, I can't believe we're having this conversation because today we finished up. Um, today was one of those crazy days where it was deadline, 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 deadline. Plus, like everybody on the planet, I've got my whole family home and the dog and the cat are fighting nonstop. And I've got a audio crew here trying to record the last chapter of an audio book. Oh, wow. And we are already two days over. Because yesterday we had huge thunderstorms, mm. so we couldn't do anything. So I am recording and I'm like trying to focus. And then I hear my son yelling at the TV because he's playing Fortnite or something with his friends. So I go out and I like, please, please, please. And then I go across the hall because Chris is on the phone with his feet on the thing. Chris, we're recording an audiobook, And I can feel my temperature. And so then I go into the kitchen and I get on the phone with somebody that I really like, Sean. And I hear information that is the exact opposite of the contract that I signed. Mm. And I had, for the first time in my business life, a flip the table moment. Do you remember on The Real Housewives? Where, was there, is her name Teresa? Like yes, she sure. flipped that table. <laughs> on New Jersey. I, on New Jersey, <laughs> yes. I did that today on a business call. I, lo- I, I And you know what I did afterwards? I put myself in pause Mm. because I felt like that runaway train. And here's the thing, everybody. When your life starts to feel like you're that truck barreling down the highway, a lot of times when life is pressing the accelerator, we think we have to go faster. We think we have to do more. We think we have to add more to our to-do list. We think we have to run, run, run. The only way to slow down a runaway truck is for it to pull on one of those off ramps Mm -hmm. that are all sand that slow it down. And so when you get hot, your body is becoming a runaway truck. When you get emotional or or you're in a state where you're really reactive, you are now a runaway truck. The only solution is to think about that off ramp that you can put yourself on because you can't turn a runaway truck. You can't pivot. You can't even get it under control. It's only when you slow it down that you can turn it or get it back under control. So I went at 2.30 today and I took a bath. Yes. I have never taken a bath (laughs) on a Tuesday at 2.30 in the afternoon in the middle of a work day. But I was in such a reactive, emotional, revved up state that I had to put myself in pause. Now, why a bath? The reason why a hot bath is because your nervous system can be controlled by your vagus nerve. Mm. 
Your vagus nerve runs from your pelvic floor all the way up through every single organ, through your vocal cords, and through the back of your, your brain. And if you stimulate your vagus nerve, you can switch from the sympathetic, para, nor, sympathetic nervous system, which is your to your parasympathetic nervous system. It takes about 10 minutes. And the way that you can do it is get yourself in a hot bath or a hot shower and the heat and the warm water immediately lowers your nervous system response. Or get outside for 10 minutes and take a walk because when you get outside, you will naturally take deeper breaths. Do not take your phone, don't take your earbuds and you'll be stimulated by all these things around you and that will slow down your nervous system. You are in control of your nervous system if you want to be. And those are two simple things that you can do. But honest to God, just an hour and a half ago, I was in a hot tub trying to calm my ass down. And it worked. That's why I'm like so grounded right now. The next thing I want to say, when, and you asked me about well, what does it feel like when I get that feeling and I said I get hot. I actually recognize that, and it, I just thought of this, while you were talking and I want to share it with the audience because I think it's something that they should do as well when I was a kid oh I'm not going to get emotional I don't feel like it today because <laughs> I'm an emotional <laughs> person I need to go take a bath I'll be right back <laughs> <laughs> but you know and this is serious so even though I'm, I'm laughing when I would get off the school bus in kindergarten I mean kindergarten not kindergarten but in grade school in general when I after I had turned eight years old and my my sexual abuse had started when I would mm -hmm. get off the school bus and I'd be walking home that feeling of just like, I do not want to be in this space, but here's mm -hmm. where, here's what I realized today. There are times even at 42 years old where I'm pulling into my gate to my, where I live and I'm rounding the corner and I get this nervous feeling. And I say to myself, why are you nervous? I, I, I constantly ask myself that never and I never could answer it and I was like oh well maybe I'm nervous because I'm excited to see my kids no because they're going to get on my nerves maybe I'm excited because I'm excited to see Scott yeah that that's true but this is like a different feeling I was like that's not the feeling I get when I'm going to like like when uh -huh. I finish this and I go see Scott and I just realized it's the same feeling I had of not of just pulling up to my home and, you know, after years of therapy and, you know, still needing it, it's it's so interesting. Like, you constantly see these little things. And I think that it also comes back to what you said about being a, a young person and feeling it and not necessarily remembering it up here. But you're, I think you said your nervous system. Uh, yeah, well, so let me, you want to know what's going on? Yeah, of course. So what's happening is you're responding to what we call an environmental trigger. Mm. And there is nothing wrong with going home to your house. But for years, the act of walking through the door puts you in danger. And so here's the thing. You didn't talk yourself into the trauma you experienced. The trauma happened to you. So it is very hard to talk the trauma out of your body. No matter how much healing you do, through talk therapy, mm -hmm. which is so amazing. Part of this is physically wired in your nervous system. And that's why some of the modalities like the uh, rapid eye movement therapy, which has you look at a lot of blinking lights while you talk through some of these core experiences and the lights distract your mind as you're talking through it. And then you come in and tell yourself, what do you need to tell yourself now? That I'm safe, that I have two boys of my own, that I'm whole, that I'm loved. Like all of those things that, that Sean that was getting abused needed to hear. And what happens is because your mind is getting distracted from a wiring standpoint, as you look at the lights, it allows your body to start to heal some of that programming. The other stuff that they're finding that, that is amazing and has great potential is all the new research with cybacillin and with ketamine through guided therapies. Because again, you experienced physical trauma and 
part of the reason why your stomach was was in knots is it was an alarm system mm. saying, I know what happens when I go in there. And the this is very common. A lot of people, and I think I think, you know, if you're listening to us, this 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 one when I say it, a lot of people go, Oh my God. If you grew up in a household that had conflict or an alcoholic parent or there was abuse, typically that abuse happens when somebody comes home at night. The drinking start, the stress of the day gets unloaded in the home. And so there are a lot of people that maybe didn't even experience the abuse, but witnessed it, felt it. They were in a home where it was happening that around five o'clock, even though it's 40 years later, as an adult, as the lights start to dim, you start to feel anxious Mm -hmm. and you don't know why. The reason why is because you don't think about it, but your body remembers the lights are starting to go down. Something like a garage door going up or just a can of beer cracking open could trigger you if you had an abusive alcoholic for a caregiver, even though you're safe right now. Why? Because your body and your nervous system is designed to keep you alive. So it remembers the shit that was scary and it will continue to ring alarm bells throughout your life. The great news is that if you start to identify all these little things that trigger you, pulling into your driveway, dusk, the sound of a beer cracking open, a certain song, a certain meal, a certain time of day, you can now find the pattern that's at the heart of it and you can now replace it with something else. Cracking a beer, oh, good to know I'm safe. For the fear of disappointing people, we've talked about one place that it comes from, which is making sure not to create a scene and making people like you. That's one lane that most of us have and I'm gonna tell you a story in a minute about how you can manage this. The second lens, and I gotta give credit to my business partner Mandy for this, is that so many of us have this perfectionism gene. And the reason why we're perfectionists is we're trying to insulate ourselves from criticism. That if you get it perfect, no one will give you feedback. If you get it right, nobody's going to criticize you. If you do it perfect, then no one will be able to attack you. And the problem with that, and that's just another side of the same coin, which is the fear of disappointing people. You're managing not disappointing people, not by lying and not by being codependent, but by actually trying to be a perfectionist so that nobody criticizes you. So let me tell you a story about the fear of disappointing people in my own life because this is the biggest trigger in my life. I mean, it goes back to being in fourth grade, right? It's there. And this is another thing, I, I literally have to remind myself of this, everybody, every single day. You cannot remove the things that trigger you. You can't. If you've been doing a pattern since fourth grade, there will be things for the rest of your life that will trigger that pattern to come up. But you can always choose not to repeat the pattern. So you'll be triggered and be afraid that you're gonna disappoint somebody. That's real, that's normal, it's natural, it's part of being a human being. I think it's interwoven into every relationship where you love somebody. But you don't have to behave the way that you always behaved when you're nervous about disappointing somebody. So let me give you a dumb story, you ready? When my husband and I got married, my father gave us this really incredible gift. He gave us an antique pool table. I grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, where Brunswick was founded. And my dad has a hobby of going to garage sales and estate sales and buying old dilapidated pool tables and then he restores them. So when Chris and I got married, he bought us an old dilapidated pool table from the same era as our house, which is the 1870s. He restored the whole thing and then recently he and I rented a U-Haul and we drove this sucker from Muskegon, Michigan to Boston, Massachusetts. My dad and I took a road trip. Get there and we assemble the pool table in what used to be our playroom. Fast forward three or four years, the speaking business takes off, my business starts to grow, we have people that work for us, and my kids are older, we don't need a playroom, we need an office. The pool table is in the middle of this thing. For the first two years of having the office, we kept the pool table there. Why? Because I didn't want my dad to be disappointed, because I love him. Now, he visits our house twice a year for two or three days with my mom. 
And I kept this thing occupying a third of our office for two years. And then I realized I'm being ridiculous. I'm being absolutely ridiculous. Now here's the thing. Will he be disappointed if I take the pool table down? Absolutely, definitely. There are always going to be things that you do, decisions that you have to make in your life, in your business, for your family, that will disappoint other people. It's unavoidable. But the fact that he's going to be disappointed should never be the reason that I don't do something that is aligned with my values. Now, let's take it a step further. When you make a decision that is likely going to disappoint people, or that does, still make the decision, because it's your life. There's nothing worse than when you start to rob your future and your life and your happiness because you're so focused on other people. However, if you love people, you can still take care of them when you make that decision. So let me go back to the example of the pool table. So I knew I was gonna take it down. I knew my father was gonna be disappointed. I was disappointed. I don't have a big house. So I don't, you know, I don't have the room for a huge pool table. I don't have a finished basement like a lot of people. I don't have like a cool garage game room thing like, I, don't, I just don't have it. I called him first and said, I need to talk to you about something. You know the pool table, I love the pool table. Dad, my business is growing so much, I actually need an office. And, oh great, it'll be great in the office. And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah it would, except I have you know three or four people showing up and we gotta put some desks in there for now. Even went down, well you could put a piece of plywood, and they could work on the pool table, and then they could do the thing, and then the thing. And now my heart is racing, because I don't want to disappoint my dad, and now he's fighting for the, and I had to just say for me, dad, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna hire professional movers in the pool table business to disassemble this with love and care. We are gonna store it beautifully. When I either get a full-time office offsite, or I build a barn, or I build a different house, <laughs> this will have its own beautiful room dedicated to you. So we had this beautiful conversation. Now, was he disappointed? Absolutely. When they come to the house and visit, which they just did, and they walk into the office, do I feel a pang? You better believe I do. It doesn't matter. That's all normal. I still need to make the decisions that I need to make. And the difference, what's changed, is how I relate to that fear. So instead of what I would do in the past is, I would make a decision that doesn't serve me. I'd leave the pool table, and then I'd be all about it. I'd leave the pool table as a way to make my dad happy, but it makes me miserable to leave it there because I need the space, right? And then I'd be kind of annoyed, and then he'd come, and I'd fake play pool because I kind of want to rub, you know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like we do all this that's not real. And what I've been able to do for myself in some instances when I catch it is to hit it head on and to be authentic and to still take care of people. And what I've also come to learn is that people can be disappointed in you and they still love you. You know, you're never gonna get around this. Everybody in your family is gonna be disappointed with you, probably once a day, probably. And you have the ability to retrain how you respond to that trigger that rises up in you where you start to fear that you're disappointing somebody. And the answer really is make the decision that's aligned with your values and the thing that supports you, and then take care of the person by being honest and straightforward about it dealing with their disappointment head on, because that's really the adult thing to do, and that's what you do when you love somebody. The way we've all been handling it, myself included, is manipulation, lying, resentment, withholding, and that doesn't serve anybody. I'm gonna share with you a story about how I figured it out, and then I'm gonna give you some advice about how you can think about it, and then I wanna say a few other things about the fear of disappointing people, because this is, I believe, the single biggest factor for most people that robs them of success. That you use what other people might say or think or be disappointed by as an excuse to not fully be yourself, to not fully go after what you want. And so first let me talk about triggers because I believe that for most of us, the habit, and I use the word habit because habit just means that it's a pattern. We have a pattern where we fear disappointing people and then that triggers us to operate in certain ways. That that pattern began a very long time ago. And I think it's safe to say that for 99% of us, you can find where it began somewhere in your childhood. And it probably doesn't matter that you find the first 
because you probably have 150 examples of being terrified that your dad was going to scream at you or terrified that your mom was going to get cold and get that tone of voice or terrified that somebody was going to be upset with you. Like, because the fear of disappointing people really has more to do about being in trouble with somebody, right? So for me, I know the moment because it was a really defining moment for me, but I didn't remember it until I was 27. What happened is I had a memory being in a, a group environment during a seminar. Somebody was sharing about being a sexual abuse survivor and she was talking about her sister. And all of a sudden I had this memory triggered where I remembered being in the fourth grade and I remember being on a ski trip with my family and a couple other families. And I remembered waking up in the middle of the night with an older kid on top of me. Now it wasn't a terrifying sexual abuse story. It was more confusing to remember it. He did what he did and then he got off of me and I remember my brother was sleeping in the bed next to me in the bunk bed. And I remember thinking in that moment, oh my God, don't make a noise. I don't want this person to hurt Derek. So fast forward to the morning, all the kids leave to ski. I'm kind of like underneath the covers and I get out, I go downstairs. And as I go down the stairs, I hear my mom talking in the kitchen. And I think I got to tell her, I got to tell her, I got to tell her, I got to tell her. So I'm in fourth grade. I round the corner. My mother's there with another mom and there's the kid. And my mom goes, how'd you sleep? And I said, fine. And what's interesting is what? A fourth grader's brain. I mean, my mom's not going to be upset with me. She might have gotten upset all right if I had said, not at me. There was this moment where I remember it now like that. And you don't have to come up with the moment because I guarantee you, you've got a hundred of them where you have a bad report card or you broke something or mom or dad drank and you heard them pull in and you felt the anxiety coming in and you went into a mode where you became quiet because you don't want to upset somebody. It was just this mode where I so knew in that moment that I needed a strategy to avoid a scene. Does that make sense? Because that's what you're doing when you are not disappointing people. You are avoiding making a scene or having them do one. Does that resonate a little bit? Okay, good. So you can go to the root cause because what I discovered in that moment in realizing, holy cow, at the age of nine, I made a decision not to tell the truth, that I would just make up what I thought would make the situation okay. And what's interesting is I can take that one decision and roll the clock forward until the age of literally like 27, probably took me longer to about like 35, 40 even, to stop lying. The fear of disappointment for me turned me into a liar and I didn't even realize it because I was so worried about creating a scene or upsetting people or having people judge me that I started lying as a strategy. I invented it as a fourth grader. It didn't work in my life. It made every relationship suck. It made me miserable, but that's what happened. So when you think about your pattern of being afraid of disappointing people, of managing, not making a scene, you don't need to find the exact trigger when it began. If you find just one and you understand kind of how old were you and what did you feel and what were you trying to manage? And then for me, what I say to myself is, oh, well, I have a lot of empathy for myself now because I understand why I developed that strategy. And now that I saw that it was a strategy that worked, because lying really worked when I was little, not so much when I was an adult. When I understand it was a strategy, I can now say, oh, well, that's a strategy that worked then. Now that I'm in this chapter of my life, I'm going to pick a different strategy. Does that help? So I want to give everybody the aha moment that I find to be so profound and so helpful that I have read um, in your work. And that is when you have shared that the reason why you can go to therapy or you can watch Dr. Nicole and I on this live stream and go like, bing, oh, cool. I can try that. I can do this. I can do that. The reason why it's so hard to implement behavior change has to do with the part of the brain that you're using when you are watching a video like this or reading a book that's a self-help book or listening to a podcast or you're in a therapy session where you're calm and you're present and you're intellectual versus what's going to happen when you walk into the kitchen and you see that everybody in your family has made lunch and not made nothing for you and left a mess for you to clean up and you lose your fucking mind, even though you promised you were gonna practice self-healing. Yeah. Can you explain to everybody the two different modes of the brain, the one you use to learn shit and the one you're actually dealing with when it comes to changing conditioning and trauma patterns and all the shit that we all have 
regardless of what we've experienced in life. Yeah. So, so the reason why we're stuck is housed in a part of our brain called the subconscious. Um, I talk about it so often now because this might sound really surprising to a lot of listeners, but in my seven, eight year program that I was in and in the additional training that I did in psychology, I knew that the subconscious existed, but never once was this really explored and talked about and understood as going to be something that in the clinical room we're working with. Um, it's really largely kept out of the room. And the part of the mind that's talked about more frequently in talk therapy is the conscious part of the mind. So to simplify, this is a really simplified version. Those are the two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. So the issue becomes, our, so the, the, the most um, commonly heard example of the subconscious, we're very grateful that we have our subconscious. That's the example that we hear when, right, I'm driving my car home. I mean, maybe not so many of us are driving now, but I'm driving my car home, right? You know, I'm thinking I'm thinking about like, you know, what I have to do when I get home, maybe. And thankfully, I'm alive and home putting my key in the door. And I don't remember shit about my ride home. How right. did I get home? Quite literally, your subconscious drove you home. So right. we, we love our subconscious because if we had to consciously attend to everything and re-remember how to do everything that goes along with being human each and every day, we would be completely debilitated. So By the way. Let me just say something for everybody. The reason why your bones feel heavy and you feel like you have taken the SAT four times every day and you want to go to sleep at five o'clock right now in the middle of this quarantine and this global crisis is because you can't rely on your subconscious to go to the store. You got to be hyper vigilant. Yes. So you're using the part of the mind yes. that you're normally not using all day, which is why you're fucking exhausted. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's very I love that you pointed that out because calorically it benefits our we have to remind ourselves that our brain is an actual organ. It lives in a phys physiological body, hormones affect it, you know, our imbalance is affected. So it's it's it, it is an, an entity and it takes caloric it needs calories to run and that's the reality of it too our brain prefers to run on subconscious autopilot we like to call it because it takes less calories so the issue becomes though our subconscious when we're born remember we're born physically and emotionally and spiritually if you will dependent on these caregivers we, we quite literally cannot care for ourselves that's the way humans are born when we're born our brains are actually shifting their brainwave patterns to really simplify it for the first several years of our life, our brains are in a sponge mode. They're, they're in theta wave state, it's called, which essentially just means that we're taking the world in. This might sound silly, but this is what we're doing. And we're learning how to human, right? We're learning how to be about the world, what these bodies do, how to take care of them. We have feelings. That's really complicated for humans. We're learning about our emotional, our energetic world. If you're a believer that we have a spiritual or soul-based entity, as I do, right? we're learning about all this. So we're taking it in. We're wide-eyed. That's why babies look wide-eyed. And we're coming up with, I call them programs, because I think the computer analogy is the best analogy. Right? Yep. Beliefs of the programs are everything. Now, from our habits, we are very habitual as humans. right? The things we do. A lot of times we do the same things we were modeled or taught to do by those around us. This involves self-care. How do we care for our physical bodies? We're very habitual in our beliefs, in our beliefs about ourselves, about others, about the world. We're habitual about in the feelings. We tend to gravitate around certain feeling states. Mine was stress. Mine was anxiety, right? We're, we then even become habitual with how we cope with our feelings. We tend to do the same things. I kick and scream. You and I, we associate, we check out. So all of these habits, I call it our habit self, is stored in our subconscious. So why am I telling you this? All of this is formed at a time where we had no conscious control. We don't, the conscious part of our brain wasn't formed. That develops after, right? So we have all of these programs from all of this early time that are running, 95% of the day are running our habit life. We become an adult. I find a great life coach. I find some great therapist. I'm talking in these sessions from my conscious mind, from the mind that can analyze and view. I'm um, typically, maybe some sessions I'm emotionally activated, a lot I'm not. I'm maybe calm, I'm at baseline, right? Everything looks clearer. Those were those great conversations. Flash forward to during the week. During the week, I'm likely back in habit self. I'm emotionally reactive. Maybe my nervous system is dysregulated. That's a lot of what's happening now. We have a collective that's living a very real traumatic experience. So a lot of our nervous systems are becoming dysregulated. And in those moments, our conscious mind, literally, think about it like this, goes offline. 
Right. And we live those same reactions. And then we feel shameful that we kicked and screamed and yelled or dissociated again three days later because we know better. And now we have this spiral of stuff. You, you just explained decades of my life where I would say, and how many of you can relate to this? You know this thing you want to change about yourself. You do all this work to figure out what to do. And then you get into that exact same situation that you hoped and and prayed and are just so committed to changing. And then you do the exact same damn thing. And so the piece that's really important that I want to unpack to make sure you get it and that it lands because I think it will help with this shame spiral. Like, why can't I stop cheating? Why can't I put down the drink? Why do I keep screaming at my kids? Why do I keep letting the panic attacks come and I can't get the deep breathing thing? It's because when you talk to Dr. Nicole, and a lot of you are asking, who the hell, well, like, well, how do I find her? The holistic psychologist is her Instagram handle. Just get there and follow her. If you are thinking or talking about what you need to do, what part of the brain are you using, Dr. Nicole? The conscious part of the brain. The conscious part of your brain. But then you go out into your life and you are subject literally to all of the conditioning I call them patterns. You can call them programming. They're all hardwired in your nervous system. So before your conscious brain can even get control of your ass, your nervous system and the subconscious part of your brain is like, I recognize this situation. This is where I'm trained to scream. And you suddenly find yourself screaming at everybody when you had promised yourself today you would try to hold it together. And then, of course, you beat yourself up. And this is why you're stuck. It's because we're trying to change with the conscious part, but it's our nervous system that's in control. Am I getting this right? 100%. And even more to piggyback on this and really hammer this home, our nervous system actually does operate below awareness. It is scanning our environment to keep the organism that is us safe to house, you know, the organism that is us to keep this physical body alive outside of our awareness. So that removes us even further from control. Meaning, if that's what happens, if I'm walking down a street and it's dark, right, my nervous system might be starting to activate myself. You know, if I get that hair on the top of my right. my neck standing up, right? So what did that? I might not consciously be even noting anything's amiss, but my nervous system is online and is sensing, whether it's energetically a shift or whatever it is. So I really want to hammer that home because especially with those of us, and I believe a lot, most of us share a version of trauma. Yep. I'm a believer in beyond the big T that most of us kind of have historically designated as the traumatic experiences. I believe most humans have suffered a traumatic experience. So when that's the case, this is why I highlight this, our nervous system is going to call the shots. It's going to, especially with the climate now, throw us into that fear-based, likely is what's happening for a lot of listeners, yep. reaction. And we actually do lack control because that's hovering so beneath the surface that it's going to call our shots before our conscious mind can even have a chance. What are the three fundamental needs that every child has? And what happens to you as a child if these three fundamental needs are not met? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where I introduce this more expanded definition because I believe that not having the fundamental needs of being seen, being heard, and given the space, I think is the best way to word it, to be authentically expressed, to be acknowledged as a different authentic being than everyone else around you, because that's what we all are. We are all different and unique. Those are our needs to be seen, to be heard, and to be authentically expressed. And Can when you they're not those met, just a little bit yeah. more. So what does it mean to be seen? What does it mean to be heard? And what does it mean to be given the space as a child to be authentically expressed? Let's expl unpack each one of those and then talk about how if you don't get one of those met by your caregiver, how it creates trauma in your nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we are, as I see it, you know, we have physical bodies, we have emotional bodies, and we have spiritual bodies. And we come into this world, you know, in, in a uniqueness. We are born, however, most of us into some family system. Some of us maybe it's with one caregiver, with other other of us have bigger, larger, extended families. We're clearly born into societies and, and relationships. Human are humans are an interpersonal species meaning we have relationships with others is how we become successful as a species. So 
when we come, right, remembering that we are being modeled how to be in the world of being human, you know, one of the things that we're also being modeled is ourselves, right? We don't know anything about this body that we're in. I don't know how to make sense of what this experience of life is, right? So, so we need help and we look to our caregivers for that help. And to speak to your point, this isn't about right or wrong or good or bad in terms of parenting. This is this is how intergenerational patterns are transmitted mm. because we, we cannot teach or we cannot model. And that's how children learn. We learn by modeling, you know, that big, that old adage, do, do what I do what I say, not as I do. <laughs> what I do. Actually, right? It's not quite opposite. Children are actually going to be watching what you do, even if you say in contradiction to that. Right. So all of this is happening. We're, we're navigating life. We're, we're learning. We're learning about ourselves. And when we are not, so, so if we don't have a parent who got modeled self-care behaviors or who came to understand who they are emotionally, energetically, and spiritually because they were not given the tools to do that, chances are they're not going to be able to, to provide you with that. Right. Oftentimes what happens too, very well intentioned, sometimes a, a caregiver will try, will you know, have had a painful childhood experience and to overcompensate will decide, you know, I will never have my child experiences and will actually now best intention engage in some over compensatory modeling of conditioned behaviors that also aren't helpful. So short of it is, right? If you don't have a parent who's not only teaching you how to care for your unique physical body, which means you have different needs, nutritional needs, you like different things, your body does well with different levels of sleep than other people, right? If you don't have a parent that's helping you to be seen in that way, to explore, mm. right, your physical needs, you're probably not going to know how to connect with your body and listen to your body's needs. Similar with emotions, right? We don't understand emotions. They're big, they're overwhelming, like I was saying earlier. If you don't have a parent, right, that can sit down and help you explore your emotions when you're having them, from the sensations that the child is having in their body to then giving that a name, right? That's how we communicate with emotions. I feel mad. Then exploring with the child how they feel better when they feel mad. Because this is, again, where we're unique, the authentic piece. To be seen in her as a unique, now energetic being. What makes you feel better now when you're sad might be the farthest thing that makes me feel better. It might me feel right. worse when I'm sad, right? So these are the ways that parents can help shape, ideally, a child to be seen, heard, you know, an authentic so that they then over time developmentally as we develop the skills to do so, now we can engage in those habits and we can understand how to care. And I, I'm going to be the first one to admit this because I spent no time in my physical body. I had no idea how to run this. I didn't know when I was hungry. I didn't know when I was full. I didn't know what made me feel good. I thought things made me feel good that didn't end up making me feel good. Right. It turns out, let alone my emotional world. I mean, forget it. You know, I'm still learning my emotional landscape that each and every day, you know, I'm learning how to put words to feelings and learning how to communicate and learning how to regulate, especially when I'm really having a big feeling. And then the whole spiritual world, I mean, that was completely absent. No one ever taught me or showed me about that aspect of my being. So now it's about cultivating and that's what reparenting is. It's going back in those areas and acknowledging the ways or the conditioned patterns that I might be living that don't serve me, often passed on, and then changing, creating change, making a choice. I use the term small daily promise because change is hard, picking a small way to integrate a new habit. That's what reparenting is. It's showing up for ourselves now as the wise parent that knows and, and learning how to know ourselves at that level. So basically, every human being, once they leave... <laughs> their parents' house, regardless of how amazing or not the parents are, everybody needs to go through some form of reparenting because for better or for worse, you were conditioned by your parents to believe certain things, to have certain behavior patterns, and to have certain beliefs about yourself. And if you weren't seen, if you weren't heard, if you weren't given the space to be truly yourself, and even worse, if those things were denied to you out of abuse or abandonment, that is trauma, correct? Absolutely, and it, even more so, sometimes our, oftentimes our denial, I talk about denial of reality, isn't even in, 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 in instances of abuse or neglect or abandonment. For instance, for me, there was such a culture just of general denial in my family where we all had these agreed upon narratives of the family and any narrative outside of there was just not spoken about. There was no room for it. So that's even a version of den denial. So if I show up and I have a different experience of this event 
and I go to talk about it in my family, if I'm a child or whoever, right? Sometimes you'll hear, oh, that's not what happened, or this is actually, right? That's another version of this denial of reality. The more that happens, the more I doubt myself and my yeah. reality, because my intuition is pinging, and, I'm, and a lot of children, they'll present this, you know, oh, you know, daddy's upset. No, he's not. Well, the, the child is having an energetic experience of daddy, and daddy might be upset to that child. And when that's denied, the more it happens, now you could have an adult that's like myself, that when they register, you know, something happening, their voice now overrides it. Oh, that's not what, what's happening. Jenny is flying to LA to do three photo shoots, and she was just sharing that she was a little nervous. And why are you nervous about getting on a plane and flying to LA? Uh, I always get a little nervous before flying. I just, I, I get a little bit afraid, like nervous leaving my kids and that everything's gonna get done and then I'll be okay on the plane. And I start to go through the to-do list of things I might've forgotten. But are you worried about things not getting done or are you worried about dying in a plane? Uh, dying in a plane. <laughs> Let's be honest. We're all worried when we fly dying about dying in a plane. And I'll confess something. <laughs> Even though I fly all the time, um, like literally some years more than 120 flights a year, whenever I get on a plane, I always think about whether or not the plane is going to go down. And I get very nervous when Chris and I fly together. Right. Because I think about what happens if something happens to Chris and I and you know our kids. Well, so here's one thing. I, I kind of get pragmatic and I go, well, I'm not going to be there, so I'm not right. going to have to deal with it. But that's <laughs> not going to help you. So I want to give you a little trick because okay. this is what has really helped me get over the fear of flying over all these years. So here's the trick. Before you do your trip, I want you to come up with one vision of what's one thing you're excited to do the whole week that you're out in LA shooting for those three clients. What's the what's the vision of the thing you're the uh, most excited about? Describe honestly, it. I mean, I'm excited about the shoots, but I'm more excited about having creative space for myself. Describe what that looks like. Describe the place you're gonna uh, be in. I'm gonna be in a bungalow in Topanga by myself with this like cute little boho haven with my journal, my books, my computer, just dreaming up the dream. Fabulous, okay, great. So. Now that you have a specific vision, you're going to start using it now because I know that the fear of flying doesn't just happen when you're on the plane. It's already kicked in, yeah. isn't it? Right. Okay. So every time you God, feel yourself- 24 hours of my kids left. 24 <laughs> hours of my children. I got to be the best mother ever because if I die, I want these memories to be incredible. So when you feel yourself getting nervous, I want you to immediately envision yourself in that bungalow. Envision yourself in that space. Hmm. She's taking a deep breath, right? And then yeah. you're gonna say these words and it's really important that you say these words. I'm so excited. I'm so excited I'm to so be excited. in that space with that creative freedom. I can see the bond. I'm so excited to have that. Hmm. And what happens when you say I'm so excited is you take the nervous anxiety energy and instead of fighting, resisting, and letting it take over, you actually kind of channel and steer it toward a different emotion, which is excitement. Mm -hmm. And in your body, there's no difference between a nervous feeling and an excited feeling. So mm -hmm. it's a simple trick that has profound science behind it. They studied mm -hmm. this at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Business School. It's incredible. It's called reframing performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm so excited, you have a specific vision, you trick your mind into thinking about the bungalow and your body settles immediately. Wow. Cool. And so you might have to use it 37 times on the five-hour <laughs> flight to LA. You might use it 72 times between now and when you get on that plane. Yeah. But it will, I'm not kidding you, allow you to take control of your body, take control of your mind, let that spirit inside you soar. Mm -hmm. I call this like mind, body, spirit, confidence. Yeah. And this is a little trick. I'm so excited with the vision. And then when you're coming home, come up with a corresponding thing mm -hmm. about what you're super excited to do mm -hmm. when you get home. And then every time you feel slightly nervous when you're on the plane, I'm so excited to pull into the driveway and have the kids run out. I'm so excited to look at my, like whatever it is, okay? okay. Got it? How do you feel? Good, excited. Oh, good. <laughs> Let me know how that works for you too.
because we're all afraid of flying. Come on, we're all afraid to die. <laughs> we're all afraid to go down in a plane, but you can, the fear, the fear is normal and real, but you have the power to use uh, body, mind, spirit confidence to steer the fear and nerves into excitement for what you're about to go do. Wow. Can I, can I stop you right there? Because that happened to me when I was 28 years old, where I uh, was in a seminar, somebody was sharing a story regarding sexual abuse when they were little. And when they mentioned uh, a sibling being nearby, it triggered me remembering something. And I would love to have you talk a little bit about that sort of period of time where the memory comes flooding back in and how you or what allowed you to say, that's not just a memory that actually happened. Cause I think that, that, that flooding happens for a lot of people, but it's the accepting or saying that it's real. And I'd be curious, given what a deep thinker you are and what a spiritual guide you are, if you have any, uh, anything that you could offer about the, the, that space between remembering and actually believing. I will say that if your body remembers, if you're feeling into a memory, it is indeed real. Hmm. And you may not have all the information around it, but your body is revealing a somatic experience of trauma that has become safe enough in that moment to come to the surface. It takes people, it took me a full year to fully accept that this was true. It took, it can take people a lifetime. Most people in my 12 step meetings, when I would talk about it in women's meetings, they'd all say me too, me too, me too, but, but I'm over that or I'm not yeah. good or, or yeah, some weird things happened to me when I was a kid or my dad was always weird to, towards me or whatever. And just sort of be like, but that didn't really happen. Right. 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 Because the shame and the terror of the trauma, and this goes for any trauma, is so impermissible that we will do whatever we can to avoid having to ever face into it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. I need to shut this door. I hear these guys. Here we go. Okay. What? And that really speaks to some of what's occurring right now for you, because we have these exiled child parts of ourselves that are locked up, tucked away, never to be spoken of again, because there's so much shame and so much terror and beliefs of inadequacy and not being lovable. And we build up these major protectors addiction, anxiety, dissociation, rage, control, workaholism, 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 just, just all of the above. And those are all what in IFS, internal family systems therapy, we call protector parts. And the protectors go on high alert to manage the exiles. And so they work, 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 work. For you right now, my love, let me help, let me help like neutralize by saying this is such a textbook moment and I don't want to take away this, <laughs> the, the truth of it, but I also want to just, just sort of neutralize it by saying, this is so natural. You're facing into trauma. You're having a huge life event. You've left your home of a, have many, many years. You're moving into a new space. Things are changing personally, professionally, change, change, change. Typical control protectors are being dismantled. Exiles are peeking their head out of the closet. Protectors are fucking coming in saying anxiety has to swoop in and dissociation has to swoop in. And all of it, all of it, all of it is like, no, 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 no. Little people don't come out. So what I want to acknowledge is that this is the human experience of people living with not fully processed trauma yet, right? Which is all of us, all of the human condition. And for those of us like you and I who have had big T trauma, the protectors are just, are the same as all other people's protectors. Ours are just a bit more extreme. Right. But the great news is this. We all have 
inside of us, what is known as self energy with a capital S and self is you might consider it your higher self, or I love to refer to it as like the internal parent. We have an undamaged resourced self and that self has many qualities, courage, compassion, curiosity, calmness, creativity, connectedness. And so when I was speaking to your parts earlier, saying to your anxiety and saying to your dissociation, I have a lot of compassion for you. And I have, and I'm curious, you know, offline, I'd love to get to know you more (laughs) and be there for you. And I also am a calm energy towards you. That's my self energy speaking to those parts of you that are activated. But the cool news is, is that you have that self energy within you too. And just even co-regulating with me right now, we can connect on this beautiful value of these parts and thank them. We can connect on the up-leveling that's happening, you know, celebrate the up-leveling. We can connect on the safety that you've created for yourself, taking the medication again, bringing yourself back to safe, a safer baseline. And, and acknowledge and honor that going through the journey of even slightly lifting the curtain on those exiled parts is fucking terrifying. Why is that? Like I, I, I sit here and I go, I, you know, I think a lot about how intellectually, you know, you were talking about from the outside, I got it all handled intellectually it doesn't seem that scary but there is something you're right that's terrifying what are the exiled parts because i think they're the little children they're the little they're the little kids the little a girl that was abused the the little girl that was in terror and got stuck there yeah yesterday i did some work with my therapist around my little girl the traumatized girl And she was just trying to get to the girl. And I was like, no, 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 no. We got to get to the the protection mechanism in front of the girl. And it was like, I saw this huge wall of ice, excuse me, like glass, but like almost like icy glass. And I said, okay, I'm ready to take a sledgehammer to that glass. And so I started sledgehammering the glass and cleared it out. And behind the glass was this little girl. She was like six, frozen, totally enclosed in, in in, in a like full ball of ice. And that's literally, that visual is literally what it is. It's literally what it is. The, 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 the traumatized children get frozen in time, locked up in the basement, and we build up all these forms of protection. So we don't have to face that terror and that fear ever again. It's too scary. But the irony is, is that we're facing it every day. True. True. Because every single time that protection mechanism doesn't work or something's out of control or something is different than we planned or we make a big move or we get, you know, burned or whatever, little girl starts to freak out and the protectors come back in. You know, it's just boom, boom, boom. It's constant. It's constant. And so this is a undoing trauma, which is what this whole book is about, is a gentle, slow, steady process of retrieving those parts of ourselves that have been so exiled, but it can't be ripping the door open. It's just too extreme for our system to do that. Yeah. (sighs) Wow. Yeah. I, I, I relate to the ripping the door open and, and it's, I think the the thing that is so interesting about your book too is that it's so timely because after the pandemic, everybody's traumatized. Right. That's actually a really beautiful point. So first of all, everybody was already traumatized, but they were doing a really good job of containing it with their protectors, alcohol, workaholism, going out to the bars, seeing friends, sex, porn, dot, dot, dot. Pandemic hits, boom, all of our controlling mechanisms are lifted and ripped away from us. The world feels out of control. The world feels unsafe. So all of the protection that we've built up around ourselves to feel safe and in control is taken away. What happens? We're left 
with ourselves. We're left with the little children. <laughs> and that's when people went one of two ways. One way they, their protectors got louder and more extreme or the other way they started to just say, I'm going to start to do some work. I'm going to look a little closer. Yeah. That's where happy days lands in their hands. Hopefully if they are having that desire to do the work and gives the guided path from trauma to profound freedom and inner peace, because I believe that God gave me the gift of extreme trauma to live, to tell what it means to be on the other side of it. And remembering the, the sexual abuse in 2016, and then accepting the reality that that's what happened. There's so many tools in this book, but you really dove in like head first. And it feels like, I mean, this is what your ninth book. Mm -hmm. These books come through you and through mm -hmm. your lived experience. And you've tackled sobriety and you are a widely followed and respected spiritual guide for folks. This is at a whole different level though. And when you even wrote this, your publisher said that they were worried for you. Yeah. Why? Yeah. My publishers, uh, we have the same publisher. They, uh, they called me up. First of all, I've submitted so many books to them. And it's always like, great, going to print, you know, a few little copy edits and I'm always <laughs> like, thanks, you know? Uh, so I expected that. I get an email from Patty and, and Michelle from Hay House. And they're like, we need to talk. Like, what? <laughs> get on the phone with them. And they said to me, listen, Gabby, we're, we're anxious for you you're revealing one negative story after the next and you're not showing your true strength. We're not seeing that girl with all the power on the stage and all of the books you've published. And I said to them, my ability to be this vulnerable is my true strength. And I can see the shift in them. I could really see it. And I also listened to them because I think that there's, as, as a, rock and tour and as a guide for folks, sometimes you do need to know how much you want to reveal and how much you want to pull back. And there's a whole chapter that I took out actually, just to sort of balance it a bit. So there was beautiful direction, but it was also very important for me to say to them, look, you've known me in one way. And that's a big part of who I am, but there's all these other parts that coexisted that I wasn't able to give voice to until now. And this is my moment. And it was funny. Um, I did an interview with the gorgeous, most beautiful Ed Milet, just one of the most beautiful humans. Oh, fabulous. Yes. A, hu hum a, a, a tremendous human. And we had such a gorgeous conversation. And Ed said to me, Gabby, why now? He's like, you're at the top of your game. You got all these books. You got these number one New York Times bestsellers. Why would you reveal all this now? And I said, there's no way I couldn't. This is the greatest contribution I will ever give to the world. This is my, this is my greatest accomplishment that I must celebrate for myself and for others to be able to look you and look everyone that I know in the eye and say, there is a way out. This is my path. This is the guided path from trauma to profound freedom and inner peace. You can identify yourself in my suffering because you have suffering too. And here's a way out. You don't have to do it exactly the way I did, but these are the steps. My biggest fear was being in front of people. So this is it right here. This? Really? How do you feel in your body right now? So when I, when I got called, I, could, I just, I went and bawled in the bathroom for a little bit. I think you're doing fantastic. Yeah, I'm doing really good. Your body, when you're about to do something that's important to you, it goes into a state of being prepared to be present. That's all that's happening. So right before you're about to hit live and you feel your stomach turn, anybody feel that when you're about to go live? Yeah, do you know what's happening in your body? The blood is pulling away from your digestive tract and it's actually going to your organs so that your body is in a state to be prepared and focused. Because if you're doing something where you're prepared and focused, you don't need to be digesting your food. And that's why your stomach grumbles. That's the only reason why it's happening. Nothing's about to go wrong. Your body's preparing to do something that requires focus. That's it. That is it. And here's an even TMI thing. You know how before you're about to give a speech or maybe you're doing something you really prepare about and suddenly you gotta go to the bathroom? That is your body getting rid of extra waste. 
so that if you had to run, you could. <laughs> Seriously. That's what that's for. And it happens to me every freaking speech. <laughs> 10 minutes before, I'm like, where's the bathroom? They're like, you can't go right now. I'm like, but I have to go. You can't go right now. Um, yeah, you're the same. And so it's never going to leave you. And it's a good thing because your body's trying to help you focus in the moment. That's all that's going on. It's our minds that screw it up. So what is the biggest obstacle that you're facing right now? Just this. This? People looking at me, yeah. The, the, all the eyes, it's, it's overstimulating for my system. I, okay, well stand up. Like a panic attack. Yeah, yeah maybe, okay, so you're standing here, it. and I want you to just, okay, you're gonna stand in front of me because I don't even wanna be uh, standing, and, and I want you to just kind of look into people's eyes. Look all the way in the back row over here. Look in the back row over there. Yep. I'm so glad. I need this so much. What are you, um, what are you getting from this? That I'm safe. It's okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. And look, people are going to, there are going to be people that judge you. There are going to be people that comment nasty you know, stuff on your thing. And one of the things that I want to share with you that's really fascinating is that I've read, I read something about this psychological thing that happens when people tweet, when they text, and when they um, write comments online. Psychologically, when people are doing that, they're not thinking about you. Believe it or not, they're not thinking about you. Because what happens for most people is that when you read an article or you read a tweet, and you're like, well, that son of a, you know, and you like go off in your body, the reason why you go off and react is because you read the tweet. It's actually a psychological state as if you're talking to yourself. And so if you don't agree with what the person is saying, you react to it in your own mind as if, Mel, have you gone crazy? You don't believe that. And then you sound off in a comment, not even thinking about the other person. You're literally debating yourself. And so they've done study after study about trolls, about people that write stuff, because I think the scariest thing about putting yourself out there, particularly if you're doing it in videos, or you're putting your work out there, or you're putting your business, you know, you're launching a coaching business, or you're launching a business to help other people. When you put yourself out there, people will come back. And this is where it is so important to understand that when people react, they're reacting to something in them. And they're not even psychologically capable of considering you or your opinion. Because we think, well, how could somebody possibly think that? Because I don't think that. So if somebody reacts to you in your life, for example, and you decide to quit your job, and you decide to become a personal trainer, and you decide to launch a coaching business, and you get some of that kind of side eye from friends, right? <laughs> Part of what's getting confronted is they don't know how they could possibly do that. And they have been talking to themselves in their own minds that it's not possible. And so they're having a debate with themselves. Well, phew, nobody makes money in network marketing. I mean, phew, really? Watch me. So they say those things because they're talking to themselves. You know, the irony about, about me is you guys think I'm talking to you. It's actually a, a pep talk out loud for myself <laughs> at all times. <laughs> yes. So understand that you can find people to support you. You will always find people to criticize you. Watch, though, how when somebody outside of you criticizes you, how that triggers the internal pattern. So what is the pattern that you have of thinking that gets triggered that disempowers you? That I won't have any words. You won't have any words. Let's go deeper than that. Is it something about being loved or being unworthy or not being good enough? What is underneath, I won't have the words? Yeah, they won't be the right words, and I, it won't be good enough, yeah. Okay, and so do you have an opinion that you're not good enough or not deserving of success, or that you're not smart enough to make a difference? Yeah. 
What is the one? What is what is the thing that hooks you? That you say to that, yourself that I'm stupid. That, they're okay, there we go. That's a good one. Not a good one, but you know what I mean. That's a good one. <laughs> or I'm a piece of shit. That's my big. Okay, I'm a piece of shit. Now we're talking. Yeah, that's the big one. Yeah. Who told you that? I don't, I don't know who told me that. When did you funny. start believing that? So it's a little girl. Yeah. God, I've just been saying it for so long. I, I don't know. That's okay. She said, I've been saying it for so long. I don't know. Yeah. As you now know what you're looking for, you're going to start to connect the dots. Okay. And so here's the thing. At some point, you started telling yourself, whatever, I'm a piece of as a strategy. You did it on purpose as a youngster, as a way to survive things that were happening. Because maybe when you said, well, I'm a piece of you actually got really quiet and you didn't get hit. Or maybe when you said that, you uh, removed yourself from situations yeah. when you would have been abused or something. It worked because it protected you, as weird as it sounds. Yeah. Is that, are you seeing something? Yeah. What are you seeing? Well, yeah, my dad didn't want, he wanted me to be quiet in the corner, being quiet, yeah. He couldn't make noise and okay. cry. Okay, and if you got, if you raised your voice, you got in trouble. So do you guys see the link now between why she has a concern about finding her words? Oh, yeah, I didn't get that one. You see that now? Yeah. So every time that you are in a situation where you need to speak up, how many of you are relating to this, by the way? I have a theory about all of us that we have patterns and strategies that we, we, we created when we were little in order to survive situations. And what she internalized was don't speak up and you're a piece of shit if you do. And believe me, that protected your ass. It worked because you didn't speak up and you didn't get in trouble with your dad. Right, and I still got the love. So if I speak up now, I'm gonna lose my dad's love. Do you see this? Yeah. So this is a pattern that got written when she was little. And it was written by someone else and it worked, it worked. The problem is now that yeah, you're- It's not working now. It's not working now. <laughs> it's not working now. Not working now. Can't and see, forward. exactly. And so this is what's fascinating about all this. There are places in your life where you have patterns that you don't even recognize, that were strategies that you developed when you were a kid. And so in the areas where you're really frustrated, that pattern is probably not present or conscious, something that you're aware of. And so every single time, because you've been repeating this and repeating it and repeating it, every single time you're about to hit play, every single time you're gonna stand on a stage, what's gonna be right there is don't speak yeah, up, yeah. You're, freeze. Yes, freeze. And you're going to go five, four, three, two, one. The only thing to, that actually overrides this pattern is to speak. And through speaking, you will see that you're not a piece of shit. You actually have something to say. Or you could make fun of it and say, well, I guess I'm just a piece of shit with something to say. <laughs> That's going to be my thing. Yes. I'm a piece of shit and I got something to say. That's right. And I also like the strategy of kind of making the fun of the stuff, even the heavy stuff, because it loses its grip on me. It works for me. It may not work for you, but it's something to try. Okay, you got it? Thank you. Cool. Great awesome. job. What are the steps? Like, how do you begin? Like, I think a lot of people can relate to the cracking because I, you know, as you were telling the story of 2016, like, you know, I, I can't, I, for me, I have been saying for two years, I, I can't handle one more thing. Like I can't, I can't keep, I can't keep operating like this. I can't. So how does somebody recognize number one, that there is that cracking and number two, what is the next best couple things just to get started? Because obviously it's a long, slow, deep healing journey. It is. It's, it's a long, slow, deep healing journey, but what one of my readers said to me today in an interview, she said, I feel like happy days will take five to 10 years off of your therapy because it, it, the, with the direction and the awareness and the understanding, it actually just fast forwards things pe for people because it, it takes away all of the time that you need to figure it out. And then you can go deeper, but 
first steps for how do you know you're cracking into something? And this doesn't necessarily mean that you are mem- remembering something that you dissociated from, but that you're accepting something that you've been running from. One is to accept that we're all running. Two, it's to start to witness some of the, notice some of the behavioral patterns, triggers, and the ways that you respond to them. So first, at first, we can kind of begin to take an inventory of like the responses, right? The, the, act, the, the extreme ways that we react. So are you turning to drugs and alcohol? Are you overworking? Are you burning yourself out? Are you f- feeling extreme gastrointestinal issues? Are you having insomnia? Are you having a lot of physical conditions that you can't get a diagnosis for? Are you having extreme anxiety? Are you struggling to, you know, not rage out out of nowhere? Well, one of your theses is that I love because it's very hopeful and it's true is that there is a, this, you talk about the self with the capital S and that there is a returning to that that is desired by all of us. And in many ways for me, this book felt not as much about trauma as it did about spirituality, because you can list all those negative things, but the flip side of this is that there is this, as you say, calm, confident, that there is a person in a self energy inside of you that you're trying to get back to. And the cracking is a moment when you realize that all this running that you've been doing away from that calm, compassionate, confident self is no longer working. Yeah. In many ways, the cracking is a great sign because it it's feel like it. <laughs> it definitely doesn't feel like it, but it's a great sign much as my therapist said, I said, why did I remember this now? It was 36 years old. And by the way, statistics show that most people don't remember their dissociated trauma until their fifties. Really? Yep. Wow. I think it like the stat was like 80% or something crazy. My therapist told me. So when we, when we're cracking, what's happening is in my therapist case, she said, you were safe enough to remember you had gotten yourself to enough safety to remember. So I want to once again applaud you because all the work that you've done on yourself, decades of devotional work that you've done for yourself and shared with the world has gotten you to a place where you're safe enough now to crack into more. And it's fucking terrifying. But the best advice I could give anyone right out of the bat is to start to connect to that self energy. So how? So self is there. Self is re- ready to go. It's this lo- totally loyal parent that's just ready to pick you up in, in the second that you ask for help. Self is qualities of curiosity. Hmm. And so there's three questions you can start to ask yourself in the moment when the anxiety comes up. Instead of pushing the anxiety down, you can befriend it. And you can ask three questions. You can say, okay, what do I notice about the anxiety? So where does it live in my body? Would you want to do it with me right now? Sure. Okay. Sure. Are you connected to the anxiety in this moment? Not this moment, but I- Okay, is there something else? I'm familiar with it, so I'm more than- Well, is there anything else that might be up right now that- uh, that's, that's a protector part that you're like, I want to kind of talk, talk, talk to. Um, it's interesting now that we're talking about it, I feel a little anxious. Okay. Okay. So it's I'm so programmed to run that staying still, which is what this new house in Southern Vermont represents this real quiet place. I feel tingly all over right now. Okay. So there's a tingly, a desire to run, and then like this little anxiety kind of right back in the background. Completely. 
Okay, cool. Could we ask the tingliness and the desire to run to maybe just go in the the go out on the patio and have a coffee and just, or have a cup of tea and just take a take a minute just to give us a little space to talk to the anxiety. Would that would that be okay with them? Sure. Okay. So just taking a moment to check in. You can close your eyes if you want. You can breathe, whatever you need, but just check in gently with the anxiety and ask where is it in the body right here right in your chest oh, yeah. yeah like gripping like that gripping any other ways you would define it colors shapes uh it's um like kind of hands like this and it's i'm also really warm under my armpits but i'm not sure if that's menopause shit happening or what but okay like this and then right here tight warm Mm -hmm. Does it have an age or a gender? Oh, female and older. Older. Okay. Yeah. Like older than you are now? Yeah, I think. Oh. I don't know. I don't think of myself as 50s, but. No, but is it like when you say older, like 80s or like. Older, uh, I like... feel like these like witch hands. It's really fun. Witchy. Weird. Yeah. Witchy. Okay, cool. Witchy. Anything else that you notice about it? As I talk about it, it sort of like pulls back a little. Okay. What do you know about it? Uh, it's familiar. Does it have any stories or, or uh, visuals that attach to it? And more like the first words that came to mind is, I don't like this. I don't want to be here. Okay. That's uh, a the, the part that's coming in that's saying, I don't like this. I don't want to be there is another part mm. it's a protector would that protector feel safe enough to go have some tea for a moment <laughs> yeah. i'll send that protector outside the office Hang yeah on. and i want to thank that protector and just let that protector know that i've totally got you and i'm not going to take anxiety to anywhere that they don't need to go mm. really high level right here we're not going to go anywhere we shouldn't go today Okay. I just want to give, th thank that protector for coming in and, and just say, have a tea, but thank you so much for speaking up. Thank you. So with a little bit more permission, just to talk to this part, what is the part, the anxious part need? Um, I, the first thing that came up was a hug reassurance, um, that I don't have to do this on my own. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that part of you know that you are here, that yourself, that your resourced undamaged self, does it know that you're here? I think so. I okay. think so. And the reason why I say it like that is because I think one of the things that I've been struggling with for so long because of workaholism and being busy uh, and on the move as kind of my go-to protector. Um, as long as I'm on the move, I'm gonna be okay. As long as I'm busy. Um, I have had a deep feeling of loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. So the and part- I, Yeah, being in a quiet place up here makes me feel really lonely. Okay. Okay. Thank you for saying that. How do you feel towards the part? I feel sad towards her, you know, tired of feeling lonely. I get it. It's painful. So she knows you're here and you have some compassion for her. So I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. If she wasn't in such an extreme role of doing, doing and anxious, anxious, yeah. what, what else would she be doing? She'd be hanging out with her friends, hanging out with her friends. Okay. A lot. She'd be, uh, doing fun shit. I don't know. Going for a hike, going for a hike. Okay. Would you be there self? Yeah. Okay. In your own mind's eye, can you just take a moment to just 
visualize taking her by the hand and, and or however it visualizes for you, however it comes to your vision. Mm -hmm. Taking her on that hike, mm -hmm. see who's around, see whatever comes up. You can tell me whatever comes up, whatever you want to share. I can totally see it. Totally. There's a black bear that uh, is out with her cubs up there. And so I just see us walking down the path and there's the black bear. How does she feel with you on the hike? Happy that I'm there. Yeah. And is there anything that you want to say to her on this hike? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Can you make a commitment to her right now that when you notice her, you can just take her by the hand and go on the hike and remind her that you're not going anywhere? Is when you say notice her, are you talking about when that feeling comes back? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. When the anxiety yeah. starts to come in, can you just yeah. let her know? I can, I am not going to let you be there alone. Right. And make a commitment maybe that you'll just take her on that hike. Maybe even literally, hand. maybe even literally <laughs> go for a hike with her. Totally. totally. Beautiful. How does she feel now just to close it out? How does she feel? Um, I think some of the protectors have come back in. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> They're welcome back. They're welcome back well, now because. They're like, they're not, yeah, no, I don't want to go to hike. You know, like, that's okay. That's okay. They're welcome back. I want to thank them for stepping aside for the time that they did. They did a beautiful job. They are welcome back. We can always ask them to step aside when there's some space, but right now it's okay. They can come back. And you now have, what you have right now, Mel, is direct access from self to the part. It's so beautiful to witness. You have direct access from your adult resourced internal parent self to the part of you that's so protective and anxious. And you've, you've given her a full media alert that you are available to her when she needs you. Yeah. Major step forward. I want to just unpack that uh, for everybody that's watching this and listening. And that is that um, here's what I got from it. When you feel the anxiety take over, take a breath, go into your body, locate where it is. Notice, notice it, notice it. And then you had me visualize the color or the gender or the shape of it. That's getting to know. What do I know about it? Mm -hmm. What do I know about it? And then you um, asked me if I had had other experiences where I had felt the same thing. Is that the next thing that happened? We go into what does it need? What does it need? What does it need? And I said a hug. <laughs> Usually what you'll hear when you ask yeah. parts what they need, they'll say, I need to play. I need a hug. I need mm -hmm. to be creative. I need, it's always the stuff that we want as a kid. The stuff we didn't get. You actually write about this in your book with your son, yeah. the four S's. What are they? Yeah. So this IFS is broken down in chapter seven, which is called love every part. And then there's another chapter called reparenting yourself where I had this massive aha moment that all the parenting advice that I was getting from Dan Siegel and all the beautiful psychologists out there that, are, that do therapy for children was so profound when working and co co-creating with my son. And I thought to myself, well, Nobody ever did this for me. And instead of being pissed about that, I said, wait a second, I can do that for me. I can give myself that hug. I can use the four S's, as Dan says, to be seen, safe, soothed, and secure. I can create that environment for myself internally. That was a big change for me. That was a big turning point. One of the things that you also introduce is this uh, heart hold. So can yes. you walk everybody through that? Because I think that is a way mm -hmm. you can provide those things to yourself. 
Yes, absolutely. And it's actually something I really want to recommend to you right now, because when I was cracking, this hold was something that really, really helped me on a moment to moment basis. So placing your hand on your heart and your other hand on your belly, and just notice which hand is most natural to your heart. For me, it's the right. Yeah, the right. You just went right to the right. So it's the right. Some people it's the left. So really have to decide what's right for you. The other hand on the belly and just take a deep breath in and extend your diaphragm. And on the exhale, just relax your diaphragm and just keep with that belly breath, taking a deep breath in and letting it go. Another deep breath in and let it go. And you might even affirm things to yourself. I'm safe right now. I have so much compassion towards all of my parts. My self energy is here with me. Even just doing the hold is enough right now to settle my system, to help me get back into that parasympathetic state, to just feel relief. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Go to it all day. It's nice Another, on the belly too. Really nice. Really nice. Another one would be tapping on the gamut point. So there's a point between the ring finger and the middle finger called the gamut. On the point. outside of the hand, right? On the back side of the hand. Yep. And I like to call this point the holy shit point. When I was early in the trauma recovery, I was terrified of getting in an elevator. Why? It's out of control, right? Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The elevator, I was in coming out of the trauma and the elevator was just the scariest thing for me. So I had to do this. You know, there was times I had to get in an elevator. And so I was tapping that point. And what does that do? This point sends a message to the amygdala that it's safe to relax. When you tap that point, you also want to take the benefit of affirming the desired feeling. I am safe. I am safe. Hmm. I am safe. Wow. That's so cool. So how long did that last to be nervous about getting into an elevator? A few months, a few months. I did a lot of EMDR, which I write about in the book. Eye movement sensitization okay. and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really beneficial. Could be great when you're in a crisis. Just, and by the way, offline, I have a person for you. Oh, I, I'm already doing it. Good. Good. Yes, you're right. It is extremely, extremely it helpful. Gives you this, it gives you a, a settled sense of safety and helps you reprocess even the minor things in the moment. And the stuff that we just did, the body work, that's based on somatic experiencing, which is a body-based trauma therapy. And so as you can see, there's a through line between all the therapies that I chose. And that is, I believe that they're all very therapeutic yet spiritual practices. So let's the, talk about that. Yeah. Because I, I found your, your book and your work, especially as it's evolved, to be really profound in the spiritual connection to mental health, to healing. And so mm -hmm. how would you describe that? The therapies that I was drawn to, I know my guide spirit, God led me to them because they were going to resonate with me most. And the reason I believe that they have such strong spiritual undertones is IFS, connect, connect to self. So for years, I was speaking, teaching A Course in Miracles. We have the ego and we have our higher self and our higher self can dissolve the ego through the experience of forgiveness, protector parts, self energy, self can dissolve through compassion, forgiveness, courage, creativity. It's all the same thing, which is a different way of accessing it. Uh, the EMDR I loved so deeply because it allowed me to work with the subconscious. Mm -hmm. and to not have to recall big things, but just allow. I fell deeply, madly in love with somatic experiencing because it let my body do the work, which is a very spiritual experience. And it got me out of the storyline and into the body. And I believe that the people who founded, particularly knowing some of them, I think that they're very spiritual people, though they may not be able to admit that in their clinical environments. <laughs> but uh there's so there, there's such a through line. And um, I also just believe that God gives us what we can, what we can handle, but also what we resonate with. Well, can we connect the dots between what you just said about God giving you not only what you can handle, but what you resonate with and the fact that you are somebody that people around the world come to for uh, 
learning how to manifest right and talk to me and us you know anybody who's watching about the connection between manifesting and this cracking open that you are attracting something that you need when yeah. you go down this journey well what i'm really proud of is that my books on manifesting aren't really manifesting light they're they're deep books, like super attractor manifest a life beyond your wildest dreams. Okay. I hooked you in, <laughs> but now I get you to work. And these books, the universe has your back. These are books on how to manifest, but they're books on how to undo the blocks to the presence of that super attractor power that we all have. Yes. And so the more we crack, the more we crack open to Amma said that, and Amma, the hugging saint, she said that when an eggshell cracks from the outside, it's broken. But when it cracks from the inside, it's reborn. Mm. So that cracking is rebirthing into the truth of who you are, the self within you, the super attractor power within you. And when you, the more you release the blocks to the presence of that self energy, the closer you get to becoming just a, a a more aligned human. And when I say aligned human, I mean a human having a human experience with a direct line to higher level consciousness, whether you call that compassion, courage, curiosity. And today, you know, it's all that capital S self energy. That's right. Is what you're talking about. So which is the same as spiritual energy, which is the same as listening to a spirit guide, which is the same as it's the, it's the voice of love. It's the, it's, it's the undamaged resource soul of who we are. I think that's the simplest way to say it, that trauma is blocking you from accessing the source of who you are. Yes. And that is love. And let's just call it unresolved trauma is the block because the trauma when transcended can be one of the greatest gifts you've ever received. I want to start a YouTube channel making do-it-yourself videos and sharing my story and journey about living with anxiety and depression and how I have become the person I am today. Uh, I'm scared to start working toward getting my dream job. I'm scared of it becoming a reality, but I want it more than anything. Why am I so afraid to start this YouTube channel? I love this question. How many of you have been thinking about doing more with social media? Give me a thumbs up. How many of you have been thinking about starting a YouTube channel or putting up more videos on YouTube? Give me a thumbs up. Lots of thumbs up. Lots of thumbs up. Guess what? Me too. This year, 2020 for me, I am going to completely level up 10x whatever hell word you want to use my video strategy and our social media strategy and so i'm right there with you and guess what when i think about what does it mean to 10x what we're already doing i get scared shitless i've been thinking about this for nine months i don't know how to do it i know how to do what i'm doing now how do you start something that you've never done you start that's how you do it. You start, you declare what you want, and then you start. And so I want to take Morgan's question because Morgan has the most amazing question, because here's the thing, why you're scared to do it is different from what you can do about it. Let me say that again. Why you're scared to do it is different than what you can do about it. So I'm going to answer this question two ways. The first way is I'm going to address why you're scared, because I guarantee you the reason why is something you haven't thought about. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what you can do about it, because you can be afraid and you can, you can do it anyway. You can be afraid and you can use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, and push yourself forward. But let's talk about why, why you're afraid to start. Number one, you probably believe you don't deserve to be successful or that you don't deserve to have a channel on YouTube. Who's gonna listen to me? Why should I be doing something like this? Who am I to put out my story? What do I have to say? 
all of those self-doubt questions that become obstacles to you moving forward, to you starting, that all tells me you don't think you deserve it. That's a huge thing that blocks people just like you. The second thing is, you are so fucking concerned about what your parents or your friends are gonna think. I think this is the single biggest obstacle for anybody who wants to do more on social media. You start to question if you're not posting about your personal life and you're not posting about your family and you're not posting about your vacation and you start to put out content that's different, content that's about the things you care about, content that's about your personal journey, content where you're giving people advice, content where you are stepping out of your comfort zone. The reason why you're scared to start is you're already thinking about what your stupid friends are gonna think about it. It is such a shame that your dreams are on hold and being minimized because you care too much about your fucking friends and your family and what they're gonna think about it. I wanna change that. The other reason why, and I hear this all the time, I know I want to be successful, but I think I'm afraid of the success. This is the number one reason why you're not starting. It's not fear of success. It's not fear of failure. You're simply afraid of change. That's it. You're afraid of things that are out of your control. You're afraid of the unknown. That's all that it is. You have no idea what's going to happen if you start. And that scares the shit out of you. You have no idea whether or not people are going to like your videos. And that scares the shit out of you. You have no idea what your friends are going to say or do when you start doing this. You have no idea what your family's going to say. That scares the shit out of you. And when you really boil it down, and when you really start to get present to that fear, all you do is sit and think about when you're going to start it. That's why you're stuck. That's why I'm doing this program. Because why you're scared is different than what you can do about it. So what can you do about it? Well, first of all, you better get your ass in this program, melrobbins.com slash best decade, because I've got you covered. We have an entire, like four weeks of programming that is free where every day we're going to either give you a video or a live stream or a blog post or um, a post on uh, social media or we're going to give you a link to uh, something that we've written that contains more resources. You're going to have an assignment that you can do in the workbook that goes with this and it's going to inch you forward. You're going to learn how to dream bigger and you're going to learn the fears that are holding you back and how to beat them. You're gonna learn once you dream bigger, uh, an exercise that's gonna train your brain to become more expansive and to be able to spot the possibilities that really are calling you forward. Then we're gonna teach you how to take one big dream that really inspires you. And we're gonna make that your theme for 2020. And then we're gonna teach you how you can start to move forward toward your dream without changing anything in your life. And then the coolest part, in my personal opinion, you're gonna be part of a private Facebook community full of people that are doing the exact same thing. It's unbelievable. You're gonna log onto this Facebook group every day and you know what you're gonna see? Videos from other people in the program who are doing super cool stuff and you know what that's gonna do? That's gonna inspire you. That's gonna encourage you. That's gonna give you the momentum and the courage that you need to do what Morgan's struggling with. Start. Because Morgan, when you get in best dec dec blah, 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 you get into best decade ever and you start to see Julie over in Switzerland and you know, Al in India and other people in Ukraine and people in the United States all uploading videos going, guess what? I went and had a meeting today with a friend of a friend who owns a bakery and I learned all this kind of stuff and now I know one step I can take. Or you say, have somebody go, I just put up my first video on my YouTube channel. I've started. You're gonna then watch their video and go, oh my God, I need to start. I need to do the same. Hey, Chris, hold on. I, Chris, yeah. could you get him out of that cage, please, hon? Thank you. Sure. This live stream is being interrupted by our created puppy, which is why I am asking my husband to uncreate him. Um, anyway, why don't I take some questions? I, I, we're getting a lot of questions about whether or not this is free. Of course, this yeah. is free. When you go to the landing page, you are not going to see a place for a credit card. This is not a free trial. 
This is not a bait and switch. This is not, ooh, once you get in and I get you in the Facebook group, now I'm going to sell you a coaching program. I don't have one. Um, oh, you got to come to my event. I do an event every day of the week called the Mel Robbins Show. It is free. You can watch it on television or YouTube. I'm not doing an event. There is literally no strings attached. And I know we're all cynical and I know we're all sold to, and I know that social media feels like a giant scam at some point, but this is for real out of service to you. And it's also selfish. Let me tell you one of the main reasons why I'm doing best decade ever. I want to have the best fucking decade ever. I want to go after my biggest dreams. I want to be empowered and inspired and even more deliberate in 2020 than I was in 2019. I want to expand my thinking. I know that I'm holding myself back. And in order to get to the next level, you can't just keep doing what you've been doing. And so I'm excited for this program because I need it. That's right, Mel Robbins, I need it. I want to create the best decade. I want my biggest dreams to come true. I know that I'm limiting myself in terms of how I dream. So I'm doing this program for you and for me. And I'm not gonna charge myself for it. So I'm certainly not gonna charge you for it. And I also need you. I need you because when I see you going after the things that you care about, whether it's pursuing your dream of having a food tour business or writing that book or Morgan starting that YouTube channel, it inspires me to dream bigger. It inspires me to get started. And so that's why I'm doing this program. Uh, and that's why it's free because I know it's going to make a difference in your life and that's worth more than any money you can ever pay me. And I also know that you may be struggling and if you're struggling financially, I believe that you deserve to have somebody helping you. And I would be honored to be the person doing that by offering this program for free. I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. I work my fucking ass off and I'm extremely successful. And so I can't afford to do this. And that's why I'm doing it because I get something out of it and it makes me feel empowered knowing I am helping people around the world to dream bigger and to learn something about themselves and to inspire themselves and other people as we go through this experience together. I think it's really important when you decide that you're going to change your habits and change the patterns of behavior that make you feel stuck or that you can't stand anymore that are the result of surviving trauma. You got to be compassionate with yourself and patient because a great analogy for the patterns that you learned that you're now stuck with right now, it feels like as an adult, is this. You spent how many years as a race car driver? How many years? How many? 27 years. Imagine if when you retired, I said, okay, you're going to play football now. <laughs> and I expect you to be the best. That's a tall order. I mean, that's an overwhelming prop proposal, you know? <clears throat> yes. It's going to take years for you to learn a brand new sport. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take small daily practice and studying and being patient with yourself to build new muscles and skills. And the truth is you might never fully build new muscles and skills. It might never come easily or naturally, but over time you could learn to be an excellent football player. But what you have to have compassion for is the fact that for the first 27 years, you were not playing football, you were driving a race car. And those are very different patterns. So if you're going to go from a situation where you have a pattern of withdrawing into yourself or lying or snapping at people or whatever your pattern is in response to uncertainty, it's literally the equivalent of teaching yourself to go from being a professional race car driver mm. to a professional football player. Mm, foreign. Just to feels foreign. Totally different skills, totally different 
neural pathways. And so when you kind of understand that, that you can do it, but it's going to take time. And I think one of the things that was the most eye-opening thing that I have ever learned was this. Um, and I only learned this recently. One of the reasons why behavior change is so frustrating and it's so hard and so you got to use all these tools in order <clears throat> to trick your brain and to plow new neural pathways in and to form new habits. The reason why it's so hard is because when you and I are talking about changing our behavior or we're talking about trauma pattern or we're talking about the shit that we do that we'd want to change or we're really frustrated by, we're using the conscious part of our brain. We're using the prefrontal cortex. Talking about behavior change is easy to do. The reason why it's so difficult is you and I can sit here and talk about it and we can make a plan for it. And we can say, okay, the next time that, that you're in a situation where your husband gives you that look, and then you start to worry that, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah is going to happen. And you feel the rage come up in your body. Like what used to drive me bananas is my husband would ask me a ton of questions. And in my opinion, they're obvious, stupid questions. And so, you know, I, of course, feel like a royal asshole now because we've come to find out that my husband has been struggling with long-term depression. And one of the reasons why he has a brain, you know, why his brain is so foggy is because of depression. And it didn't help that he was smoking a ton of weed all the time, too. And so, you know, I would literally get so frustrated because he would, we'd be talking about something and he would be like, uh, well, I don't know. What do you, what, what do you think? Like just asking right. questions that I'm like, you should know the answer to that. Why <laughs> uh, have you heard of Google? Why are you asking me what the weather is going to be, you know, tomorrow in Vermont fucking Google? Like, you know, like, and I'd go like, ah, and I hated that about myself, hated it. And I would talk to my therapist. I can't snap at him. I don't want, like, I, 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 I need to be more patient. You know, this is what my mom did. Like she would get frustrated with my father and now I'm doing it with Chris and I don't want to be that person. Oh my God. I would talk about this topic probably for years and I would make a plan to become, and I'd make a plan to put myself in pause. And then the next day or two, I'd get back in my life and we'd be standing there having a conversation and he would ask me a question that I think he should have Googled or should know the answer to. And then the rage would come. And it wasn't until I learned the fact that I was talking about the behavior that I wanted to change with this part of my brain, but the rage and the impatience and the kind of like, ah, the kind of like emotional reactiveness, that pattern is stored here mm. in the basal ganglia. That pattern operates in my subconscious. And that pattern is not initiated by thinking. That pattern is initiated by emotions that rise up in the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you realize that the behavior change, particularly when it comes to generational patterns and trauma patterns, that in order to catch it, you've got to not only figure out the pattern you want to change, but you've got to figure out the situations and the emotions that you're feeling in your body that correspond to the pattern mm -hmm. that you want to change. Because when I start to feel my ankles getting hot, mm -hmm. I know that that feeling in my body, that emotion of frustration, that is the trigger. And the reason why I have this pattern, this is fascinating, is that, you know, a lot of these patterns you learned like zero to two. Yeah. I think they say zero to six, it's like last trimester to about six years old is the bulk of the subconscious programming, which is 95% of your operating system. Yeah. Today. Uh, yeah. And they, they, they have this, there's this phenomenon in psychology called ghosts in the nursery which mean, and I'll give you an explanation. Um, so let's say there we're, we're looking at uh, 18 month old Mel Robbins An 18 month old Mel Robbins is sitting on the kitchen floor and I've got the Tupperware drawer open and 18 month old Mel Robbins is lost because I'm following my soul and I am playing with the Tupperware and I got this stuff all over and I've made a big mess and I'm just like happy as a little clam. And then all of a sudden, 
around the corner. Like my mom comes and she's walking around the corner, doesn't see me and slips and like, ah, and just reacts. What happens in my nervous system is that her frustration with the mess and the blow up and the fact that I have a <gasps> disruption in my nervous system because I'm startled, I literally sear her behavior with my emotional reaction. Sure. So frustration gets encoded in me. I don't even remember it. I'm 18 months old. Yeah. Frustration is always this emotional feeling in my body. And now I'm just literally copying the behavior yeah. I saw in the adults. You're around kind of a passenger me. at that point in time. It's almost Correct. Pilot. Correct. And so because emotions rise up before your thoughts take hold. Yeah. It's super important to pay attention to your body. Is it a, is it a twitch in the stomach? Is it a clench in the, you know, my husband says that when he feels kind of his pattern of withdrawing kick in, he first feels like his chest tightened. Mm -hmm. That's what he feels. That's, that's how he knows one of those patterns from his past in his yeah. subconscious that he doesn't want as an adult is about to spin. Mm -hmm. And so if he can catch it here, he can say, oh, here it goes. I'm about to withdraw five, four, three, two, one. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to choose something different. Mm -hmm. And so that's been wildly helpful. And it allowed me to go, oh, I get it. This is why it's not that I'm a moron. It's that I'm talking about the behavior I want to change with one part of my brain, but the behavior itself is somewhere else. So I got to fight it yeah. in the region that it's in. And right. it's also really important. You can't just catch it. You can't just interrupt it you must replace it with a new pattern of behavior because patterns repeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do if you're feeling a level of fear right now is I want you to use a concept that I learned from my friend, Carrie Lorenz, who is the first female F-14 Tomcat fighter pilot in the history of the United States in the armed forces. She is a freaking badass. And she has this thing that she's taught me called span of control. Do you know that the majority of airplane crashes are due to human error, not mechanical error? And in order to train pilots, this is something I learned from her. There is a concept called span of control, which means when you get into a situation as a pilot that makes you afraid, you immediately narrow your span of control down to three things. Because apparently, and I'm not a pilot either, so don't take my word for this, but apparently there are three things that you got to manage when you get into a situation that spikes your fear in order to keep that plane in the air, right? And so when you narrow your span of control to those three things that really matter, you tune out all the dials. Think about what a plane kind of the front of a plane. I don't even know the control panels of a plane look like. There's a bazillion things that you got to look at. Very confusing, very overwhelming. Just like right now, what are my kids doing? Should I go out? Home Depot parking lot. People are at the beach. What the fuck? I thought we were in a pandemic. What? Like you could start to wig yourself out about everything. You don't need to do that. What you need to do is narrow your span of control to the things that you truly are concerned about. I will tell you, I've stopped washing packages that come in. I've stopped being psycho about the groceries. I'm also not immunocompromised. We have been isolating in a squad with a bunch of families. We had some of them over last night outside. Um, I'm washing my hands just as much. I'm wearing my mask. I only go out when I absolutely need something like Home Depot or booze. The thing that I'm doing now, knowing that my kids are out and about, is I'm narrowing my span of control to not micromanaging them and what they're doing, but micromanaging what happens when they come back into this house. Go upstairs, change your clothes, wash your hands. That's all I can do. I remind them, spray down the steering wheel if they've driven. That's all I can do. 
I am narrowing the span of control. So um, if you feel nervous, that's what you should do. Just figure out what is the narrow span of control? What are the three things that you care about? For me, it's that my children who are now running around like a pack of wild dogs with their friends, trying to enjoy the summer and let off some steam, I don't blame them. It's what is my decontamination system for those human beings that I created when they enter my home? I'm not concerned about me. I'm not concerned about how I, I'm in, concerned about them. Got it? Good. Span of control is going to lower your fear. Well, now there's like a mad rush of young people looking to see if you will adopt them. Because <laughs> that's my first thought. My second thought was, okay, so when my daughter has anxiety or yes. my son has anxiety, my daughter more so has will ha struggle with anxiety and she's pretty open about it. Um, there's a part of me that wants to fix it. And there's a part of me that's like, how can you have anxiety when I'm your mom and we talk about these things and I pump you up and you know you have, you, you don't need to do anything to be amazing. Like, and so she just gets this incredible pep talk. Like most people would die to, I mean, that's like prose basically to, to read that and to be so encouraged. And so many people, not only do they not get that encouragement from their own parents, they don't get it from anyone. Right. So to think that she's getting that and she's, you know, her parents are together and she's had this incredible opportunity to have someone pour into her all of her life, yet she still struggles with anxiety. Totally. And, and so as a parent, yeah. that's, that's something I'm always wanting, like, I struggle with that. Like, is it something I've done? Is it, is it the manic, a uh, way that I live my life? Like, it, it, am I the person who's giving her, because I don't have anxiety, so am I giving her anxiety? So I have no idea. Here's the most important thing. It doesn't matter what you think mm. or what you're feeling mm -hmm. because the anxiety is her felt experience. That's right. Right? And yeah. as parents, I think one of the most heartbreaking and frustrating things is that oftentimes you have somebody in your life that you love, a son, a daughter, a partner, and you see all the amazing things about them and they don't see any of it. Mm -hmm. And so this is also one of the big things in the book that we write about, about how your own mind has a filter in it, this thing called the reticular activity system. And that the filter in your brain is very different than the filter in anybody else's brain. And it's constantly changing in real time based on what you think is important to it. So mm -hmm. all chapters, I think four through seven, we go through all this and teach you how to change the filter. You've experienced this filter, by the way. Mm -hmm. So um, when you go to buy a new car, Right now, everybody's seeing Broncos everywhere, right? The new Bronco is out. Okay, okay. Oh, now there's I one, there's one, there's one. Now right. I will. I yes. had I had him. So but when's now the last time you bought a car? Um, in December. Okay, and what happened once you decided what kind of car you're going to? I keep seeing that car everywhere. Correct. And it, and when I see the same car in the same color, I try to run them off the road. Yes, and so <laughs> that's your brain changing the way it filters the world in real time because of what it thinks is important to you. So if I think, for example, that your daughter is beautiful. And your daughter thinks that she's the ugliest or the biggest of all her friends or whatever. It doesn't matter what I think. Right. It matters what she thinks. Mm -hmm. And when you tell yourself over and over that you're not good enough or you're a failure or you're this or you're that, your brain actually thinks it's important. I can give you an example. So my husband went into the restaurant business. It was a dream of his. And this is actually all part of the origin story of the five second rule. And he and his best friend launched these little pizza joints outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, it ends up not going great. And they work at it super, super hard for seven years. And at the end of the business, they sold it for you know pennies on the dollar to the next investor. Uh, they left the business and they did not return the profit that they had hoped to return to mm. their investors. Mm. Now our best friend, Chris's business partner, was able to leave that business and go, entrepreneurship. I'm proud of myself. Sure. We worked so hard. And yeah, did we do what we set out? No, but you know what? I feel good about what I did. My husband couldn't do that. Mm. He left that business and said, that failed. I'm a failure. Oh. And for Was that his first big entrepreneurial? Yep. Okay. Yep. And for seven years, he would drag that into the bathroom every morning. Oh. And the human being he saw staring back at him in the mirror was a failure because of that thing. Mm. That's actually why most people have anxiety or because they ha or they ha or and because they resist the high five habit. 
because they are dragging their entire past into the bathroom and saying, because of these things that have been done to me or these things that I did that I wish I could change, I now see a person who does not deserve a high five. Yeah. And so you withhold the thing that you need right, to forgive right, yourself, right. to love yourself. The thing that you would give to anyone else. That's also why people feel anxious. Well, let's talk about that. Worry and anxiety, yes, the yeah. difference between the two. You got because it. I, I don't worry, and it's almost a problem. I, I feel, I've talked about it before. Why do you could, think you don't worry? Well, I had my brain scanned, and Dr. Amen says I just don't have blood flow in that area. So part of it's genetic. Part That's of it nice. is my faith. Yeah. Part of it is um, the way I was raised. Like, you know, we just, you just roll with everything. So, yeah. and I, my parents, I don't think were worriers. So I'd never learned the worry habit. I think it that's a part of habit. it. But, it yeah. but then to your point, it's interesting. How did my daughter learn it? Right? If yeah. your daughter's struggling with it. Yes. I'm going to fan myself because yeah. I actually think I might be having a hot flash. Oh, that's so fantastic because <laughs> that's another thing we talk a lot about is I, you just let the it change. Go, Who cares? I haven't had any hot flashes yet. What? I shouldn't even. How I just. Is that even I probably possible? just jinxed myself. Yes. I don't know. My mom right. didn't have a lot of hot flashes I'm, I'm, either. It, it happens more and more. But so I don't worry. I don't worry. All right, so let me tell you the difference. So worrying is nothing more than it, worrying is always about the future. By the way, mm-hmm. it's never about the present moment. True. And so worrying is when your thoughts start to sound an alarm about yep. what's going to happen. Okay. So it's the what if this, what if that, what if the other thing, what if the what if loop that you can get trapped into. Mm-hmm. Anxiety is when your body state changes. So worry is all the things that are happening in your head. Yeah. Oh, and anxiety you feel. Correct. Okay. Correct. That helps me. Yes. Okay. So, it, and you're still having the thoughts too. Correct. Okay. But a lot of times what will happen is that your body state can get so agitated that you even stop being present to what you're worried about because now your mind goes, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I feel like my heart is racing. And you start to obsess over the physiology of your body. And I'm going to explain kind of even more about this. Super helpful. Panic is now the big brother of all of this. Mm -hmm. So worry's a little baby. Then we got the middle schooler, which is feeling it in your body. And then you got the big, like, uh, teenager of a panic attack, which is when the body state gets so scared and upset that now your brain has an emergency system that says we're going to get you out of here so if you've ever been around somebody who panics yes. they're not rational no they're immediately like i need to get out of the room i'm gonna die i'm gonna die like they go into a mode of get me out of here as a way to rescue themselves from a body that's now sounding a five alarm mm-hmm. kind of fire so there are two ways that anxiety can come on this anxiety thing in your body. Mm -hmm. You can either start with your mind and all the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? It can happen as you're scrolling through social media and you start to see that your friends all went out and they didn't invite you. Thanks a lot. Or you see the person that's, you know, exercising and you start going, but I didn't exercise. And you start thinking it's never going to work out for me. Or you see all the couples and then you start thinking, what if I never meet anybody? So you can start with the thoughts, right? And then your body starts to go, "Uh uh-oh, and your stomach gets tense and your armpits sweat and your heart starts to race and that's how it ramps up. Or if you have trauma stored in your body okay, from anything in your childhood or anything in your past, there will be times that you feel a surge of anxiety come on and you don't know why. So there is no precursor there's no you're saying for certain people or in certain situations yeah. you might just be washing be the, the dishes the, yes. and suddenly you have anxiety come yes, on correct. and and so i want and again i'm asking and these questions because i haven't felt response, it yeah if it's a trauma response it's because your nervous system just remembered something from your past so I'll give like you a, subconsciously yeah I'll, I'll give you a really really uh common example that we've found in all the research that we've done and the people that we've coached a lot of people get very on edge as the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because if you grew up in a chaotic or abusive household, that's when people were coming home from work. Yeah, That's when the drinking began. Or you came home from school. Correct. If you hear uh, tires on a gravel road, if you hear a beer can crack open, if you smell a certain cologne, Mm -hmm. those can be things that set you on edge. And that's not even something you're consciously aware of. It's your body remembering something. Uh, yeah. And your body's now trying to help you by going, pay attention, pay attention. This is that thing. This is that thing. But then you're standing there washing your dishes. You feel this thing happen. And you're like, 
Why am I feeling nervous? Why is my son? And then your thoughts go. This is how it escalates. So it's- So can I ask, yeah. somebody who has, feels anxiety all the time? That's generalized anxiety. And that's what that- that's, And is that a physical feeling that you feel all the time? What that is, is, and I, and again, um, there's an entire chapter around this book that'll change your life. I think it's chapter seven. It's called High Five in Your Heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you're on edge all the time, uh, let me teach you about your nervous system. Yes. Because I think everybody on the planet right now, having come out of the last 18 months, everybody is right now in a state of fight or flight. Mm. Everybody's nervous system is fried and on edge. Mm -hmm. Everybody is prone to being triggered because you have just gone through a level of sustained uncertainty that no human nervous system can manage. Yeah. So here's what everybody needs to know. You have two nervous systems, okay? You have something called the sympathetic nervous system, which is basically fight or flight. Right. This is your anxiety state. This is being on edge. This is feeling like the next shoe is going to drop. This is what psychologists call being dysregulated, okay? The second nervous system that you have is called the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system. And that is your calm, cool, grounded, resting nervous system. That's how we want you to go through your day. Yeah. Because when you are grounded in your body and you feel comfortable in your own skin, first of all, your prefrontal cortex can work. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you won't be as easily triggered. Third, you'll feel more optimistic and focused. And so I want to teach you a simple trick using science to switch off this on edge nervous system mm -hmm. and switch on the mm -hmm. really positive one. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to use something called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a treasure, as you know, in your body. And it runs from your rear end all the way up to the top of your head, yeah. through every organ, through your vocal cords. All you're going to do is take your hands, put them right here in the center of your chest. You're going to press down and take a deep breath. And then you're going to say these three sentences. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you feel when you did that? I believe those things. Yeah. I feel good. Yeah. You know, I feel calmer. Yeah. So I, I suppose that brings you into that state. Yes. And pressing here actually tones the vagus nerve, mm. which is an on-off button between yeah. the on edge and the calm and cool. Mm -hmm. It's like a treasure. And so here's a couple things I want you to know. There are some mornings you might wake up and you need to do it 53 times. <laughs> there are days you might stand in the grocery store and somebody cuts you off with their cart and it just sends you reeling, hands on heart, give your heart a high five, pull yourself back into your body, switch off that stress response, switch on your grounded, calm and control response. Do you recommend people do that I mean, is there a Every way morning. to put the brake on if you're someone who um, can pretty easily slip into a panic attack? Yes. So this is something you want to start to do immediately. And I recommend you do it right after you get out of bed. Because mm -hmm. I would like for you, before you get into the bathroom mirror, I would like for you to be present and on edge. And I would like for you to be grounded in your body when you start your day. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible gift that you can give yourself because you'll feel more in control and centered and present. And then when you step in front of that mirror, you will actually be able to be with yourself. And to understand, okay, what do I need from myself today? Yeah, yeah. And it completely changes that moment. The other reason why this is important is because <clears throat> if your nervous system is on edge and that's your default, yes, you're going to be way more prone to a panic attack because you are already idling at such a stressed out level and all the chemical releases from the cortisol and everything else that's flooding your body. We need to get you back into a more neutral and grounded state. So that'll help for sure. And so it's important to understand, are my worries starting in my head or are they actually a felt experience in my body? Because then depending upon which or both it is, you can use two totally different strategies. Mm. First of all, this high-fiving your heart absolutely will work for trauma. It does not get rid of it. It helps you manage and live with it. I would recommend EMDR. Mm, I would also recommend... We're big the, fans of uh, EMDR. Yeah, and the guided psychedelic modalities are incredible. I've done those for childhood trauma, and they've been unbelievable. Amazing. Um, and so those sorts of things really help you heal trauma. This will help you control it, live with it, not be afraid of it in terms of being able to settle your nervous system. You've experienced anxiety all your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple questions around that. Number one, uh, controlling it, managing it. What are your thoughts and your experiences with 
medication, SSRIs? Oh, great question. So I took Zoloft from the age of 22 until probably 44. Okay. It was life-changing. It was Life-saving or life-changing or both? Both. It was the latter I needed to get out of a hole mm. because when I finally got diagnosed with anxiety, I have a very interesting story because I fall into the group of women, and I know you do too, that were completely what they, a part of what they call the lost generation. Yeah. So when they came out, as you know, with the ADHD and ADD uh, diagnosis back it's in the 70s. Just a boy 70s, thing. <laughs> just a boy thing, yeah. yeah. And the symptoms for women present completely differently. Mm -hmm. And when you don't treat ADHD, you tend to get anxiety. Yeah. And so there's a huge group of women our age that were treated and medicated for anxiety in their late teens and early 20s when the actual issue was ADD. It's still happening today. Oh, of course it is. Yes. I, it's, it's actually one of these things I'm super passionate about getting out into the world. Yeah. And so it wasn't until I discovered the five second rule and I started to do the part that you can do to interrupt the worry loop, which when you can cut the anxiety off at its knees by cutting off the worry cycle, you stop the escalation in your body. Okay. And so I can teach you guys how to do that. It's super simple. It's Let's do super it. Let's do effective. it. Yeah. There's one other thing I want to teach you about anxiety, though, that also is incredibly empowering because it makes so much sense. So anxiety is a purpose. Really important one, actually. Anxiety and that anxiety response in your body gets you to pay attention. Yeah. If you go into a state of being hyper alert before a test, you'll do better if you're not worried. Absolutely. Same with performance. Same with sports, like it's really, and also it alerts you to danger. So for example, if you and I were driving uh, after this interview to go get a cup of coffee and somebody suddenly swerves in front of us. Yes. And we whip the car. Yes. What are you going to feel in your body? Uh, feels like um, butterflies, I'll shake. Yep. Um, sweat maybe. Yep. Uh, a little bit of panic. Yep. And, and your muscles tense up. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So you just had a panic attack in the car. Oh, <laughs> but the reason why it wasn't scary is because intellectually it made sense. It made sense. It made sense. Yeah, like, of course, I, I yeah. almost died. Yeah, the, the swerving was your brain taking over to get you out of there. That's a yes. panic attack, yes. basically. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. In a way that's healthy. Yeah. And then when... Serves the, us. Yeah, when the car pulls away, what happens in your body? You start to... Like, it stays for a minute, uh -huh. you know, but then you start to go like, ah, okay, I'm safe. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What happens for people that struggle with anxiety is they have that response and it doesn't make any sense because they don't understand it. Mm. So it escalates because they get afraid of it. And once you're afraid of anxiety yes, yes. coming on, then you actually make it last longer yeah. because you're resisting the up and down of it. And so there's two things that you can do. First, what I want you to do is I want you to write down. Well, actually, first, what you do is for a week, anytime you catch yourself Time traveling ahead. Yeah. Or worrying. Yeah. Use the five second rule and interrupt it. Five, four, three, two, one. And just say, I'm not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You want to build a muscle of catching yourself, hanging out in the worry loop. Oh, find, catch yourself when you're hanging out there. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about your roommate situation this fall, and it's not even this fall yet. You're worried about what classes you're going to get. You're worried about whether or not you're going to lose the weight before the reunion. You're worried about whether or not you anyone's going to hire you because you've been home staying. Like you're like sitting here just in the doom loop, right? I do this with my daughter, and so I'm curious if you can give me some advice from someone who, who has it because, again, um, I, I don't know her experience, but I – we will get into this dialogue. We just did it last night. She's planning her wedding and she's launching a beauty brand. And so she was going through like all of the yeah. what ifs thoughts in her head. And she's she was like, I'm so anxious. And so I'm dismissing each one of her what ifs do and it. what ifs. And I just You're keep dismissing and dismissing worse. it and dismissing it. You and know why? then I'm like, and I'm like the toxic positivity mother, like so you're not worried, okay? Good night. I'm going to bed, but you're not worried and you're not anxious. <laughs> um, well, so when somebody who's anxious brings their problems to people, yeah. um, people are like, well, you're, cause here's the thing. I did this for years. Okay. And my kid's anxiety just escalated. Okay. So there are two mistakes all parents make. I'm taking notes. All parents make these two mistakes, including yours truly. I mean, I caused my kids years of therapy because of these mistakes and yeah. myself, of course, for blaming myself for of making course. these mistakes. Number one is invalidating the worry. Okay. We think we're helping our kids by going, 
Let me tell you all the reasons why you don't need to worry about that. Okay. What actually happens is you shove your kid further into the corner because they don't feel seen or heard. Ooh. Okay. This will change your life as a parenting method. Okay. Okay. Ready? This, yep. This is all you say. Would you like me to give you advice or do you just need me to listen? Okay. Okay. I can do that. 95% of the time, my kids say, I just need you to listen. Okay. They're getting it out of their head by coming to you. Yeah. And I have the same dynamic with one of my daughters where she comes to me and I've become her blankie emotionally. Sure. And then I immediately try to go, but that's not an issue and that's not an issue. And that's good that you have that fight with that friend because she's a jerk anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And she just is coming to be heard. That's it. And I keep the anxiety around because she's not resolving it in a healthy way because I'm fighting with her about whether or not it's actually legitimate to feel this mm. way. So I'm also making her feel less than for having these worries. I trust you. I trust you when you say this. But there's a part of me that feels like, but she doesn't see the, like, you know, if she's struggling it's with this, I, I, she, I just your, have to explain to her no, but it's that not, this is how it works. But here's work. the thing. Here's the second mistake. We think it's our job as parents to fix the things they're worried about. Absolutely. It feels like an obligation. You're only as happy as your least happy child, they say. But here's the thing. When you step in to fix it, yeah. you are telling your child, I don't think you can. Right. Absolutely. Or I don't think you can yeah. face this. You don't have what it takes. Yes. Let me do it for you. Yes. And I made this mistakes for years. I was creating a learned helplessness in my kids. Mm. I was entrenched in this toxic pattern of my daughter coming to me with her concerns and worries, which were very, very valid, and me trying to fix them because I was worried. But all she felt was, mom doesn't hear me, and this is actually a big deal. And she thinks that simple solution is going to fix it. And the truth is, the simple solution always fixes it. But she's not coming to you about mm. the stuff she's talking about. Yeah, yeah. She's actually expressing that deeper emotion of this hurts or I'm scared or I don't feel good enough. And when we stay up here, like, let's get rid of this and let's take care of that and don't think about it this way. We're just trying to help. We just love them. Yeah. The deeper thing, the deeper wound that they keep having trigger this anxiety, it doesn't actually get addressed. Mm. And so when you listen... And just listen and listen. Anything else? Great. Is there anything you need from me? Because then what mm. happens is you're teaching them how to think strategically, make requests, and ask for the help that they need. Yeah. This yeah. all comes back to, by the way, this high five habit in the mirror. Because if you can't stand in the mirror and see a human being that's trying, that's struggling, that's anxious, that feels insecure, and still go, I hear all that, and I got you. And we're going to get through it. You're going to constantly be seeking that assurance in everybody else mm. about the surface level things in your life. Mm. When the real issue is something much deeper, and when you start to connect with yourself at a deeper level every single morning, and see a human being and celebrate them, no matter where they are, even if the wedding stuff is falling apart or the bridesmaids are complaining with each other and I don't even know the stuff or sure. you're just worried you're not going to fit into the dress or you're worried about where people are going to sit at the tables or you're worried about who's going to show up. All the things. About, like all the things. You can stand with yourself with all those things going on and still love and support and celebrate yourself and know that no matter what happens, whether the seating arrangement gets right or not, or that you got your own back. Yeah. You're going to see yourself through it. I love that you're a fan of um, therapy. You talk about it. And um, also finding out the right medication, maybe even, like you said, knowing if you have the right diagnosis. Like, that's huge. Oh, because it's so liberating. Once you, like, really, truly understand your brain, which, t you know, we can probably spend a whole other hour talking about that. It just doesn't make sense that right now the standard of care is we ask a, a couple of questions, we don't look at the organ, it's and then we decide... decide What's going on with you? Um, are you a fan of therapy for kids? And Hell at what yes. age? And Any age you need it. I'm a fan of talking about everything. Yeah. Did you send your kids to therapy? Uh, when they needed it, absolutely. Yeah. When our kids, when, when our son started sleeping on the floor. At what at age? At the age of eight. And it went from one night. His bedroom or on the floor ours. in your room? Okay, okay. And it went from one night to three months. 
Uh, yeah, we got a therapist, all right. Yeah, and uh, I le- that's when I started to learn. I'm really screwing this up because I by letting him stay on the floor, I'm actually communicating. You're right. You're not strong enough to sleep mm. through the night. So do, this brought up a, a uh, an email I got from a mom this week who said um, she ended up with a daughter who ended up being very suicidal, yeah. uh, extreme bullying, etc. Yeah. And she kept telling her like, you know, it's gonna make you tougher. This is how girls are. Like. You know, you're, you're going to be okay. I went through this in middle school too, all those things. And she said, the one thing I regret not doing Did was taking it serious enough. Did by suicide? No, no. Oh, daughter's okay. alive. When you said regret, I was like, oh, her, her regret was that she didn't um, transfer her to another school yeah. and realize it was. So, you know, when I think about like, okay, you can fix it yourself. I believe in you. I trust you. How do we find that balance? Well, I think in extreme situations like that, you got to listen to your kid and the experts. Yeah. Like if your kid is crying that much for help and is suicidal, get them out of the environment they're in. Yeah. Period. Period. Um, if you have a kid that's got chronic anxiety and they're starting to opt out of life, you need support in supporting them in inching toward the things mm-hmm. that are scaring them because it's only through facing the things that are scaring them and that doesn't mean striding into a school where you're getting bullied to the point of wanting to die by suicide yeah but if you're afraid to go out they're afraid to go out of the house or afraid to invite somebody over yeah. or afraid to which is really common right now in in this age group like 13 well, to I think it's also common 19, coming out of the like pandemic the, yeah, absolutely and i think it probably has a lot to do with that they're afraid to drive their cars they're afraid to they're afraid to go off of social media. See, yet I they think hate being this, on it. Like, way, is a lot of our overparenting. Ah, uh, I think that we have so bubble wrapped our kids because we don't want them. It, it hurts when your kid is in pain that we don't force them to do things mm. that are a struggle. And I, I've certainly succumbed to this after a long day of work. Do I want to fight with my kid about whether or not they should have their phone in the room? No. Right. That's should honest. I have done that sooner? Of course. Because what I didn't realize about our kids and their phones is that part of the problem with phones in their bedrooms after a certain hour is they feel obligated yes. to be available to their friends. And to know what's going on with everyone everywhere. Yep. yep. And so there is a psychology driver that is more powerful than they are. Mm-hmm. And as parents, it's important to kind of know when to draw the line and when not, even though it hurts, even though they're going to hate you. Look at the same stuff our parents said to us, but I think it's more complicated with technology. It yeah. really is because they're on their laptops for school and they're on their phones doing FaceTime in study groups and they're yeah. on their phones yeah. in FaceTime playing video games. And that's how a lot they of were them on their phones and on their devices right. and they were forced to be so right. at, like first graders all the way through the pandemic. Well, I remember being on the phone upstairs talking to my best friend, Jody Bricken in secret at 11 o'clock with at one night. of the cords. That yeah. And like all that. of a sudden, you know, mortified because my father picks up and is like, all right, you two, I can hear you. Hang up the phone. You're like, oh my God. Okay. Hang up the phone. I got to go, Jody. You know, we we're way up past our bedtime. Yeah. And we are not doing that with our kids. Right. Because they have a whole world in their hand. And so I do think one really important thing that we put in place way too late was a basket in the kitchen with a charging station. Hmm. And after a certain uh, time, our kids had to have it in the basket. I love that tip. And love that's that tip. where our, our, my phone goes in my bathroom at night. That's yeah. where I charge it, even in a hotel, no matter where I am, because I, I can't be trusted. Yeah. I'm going to grab it and look at it. Yeah. Well, well you yeah. know, talking, talking about, about the high five habit, yeah. I was in pre- preparation for our time together today, I was thinking about how that's like one of the first things you teach kids. Like if you notice like little kids, they, they oh, learn to wave so goodbye and they go high five, high five, you know, and so why not teach them this habit and, and to give it to themselves too? And, and no, so that's what I love about the book. It it's, it's so helpful yes. for people any age. Um, you're not saying like this is going to fix somebody who's, you know, has some deeper issues to deal Actually, with, but it's a good let me, let me strategy. Tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. So a really important story that um, I think, actually there's two. One is in the book and one happened yesterday. Okay. So a woman who was in a domestic violence shelter, massive childhood trauma, just escaped a very abusive relationship. She's lost everything. Mm-hmm. And she wrote to us from a domestic violence shelter and said that what the high five habit has taught her after five days is that she knows that she has a lifetime of healing. Mm. She knows mm. she has a tremendous amount of work to do. But now she knows 
that she can have her own back. And that's like one of those moments where when that clicks inside somebody, now it's not going to change the reality of what she's facing. It's not going to change the very real obstacles that she has from a psychological and economic uh, everything perspective. But, but it, it was changes the moment. her yeah. and her ability to rise up and to face these things. Mm-hmm. And the second one was yesterday. So so this circulated in an email to our team this morning, because I yeah. like to see from our audience, what's the impact of what we're doing. And so we circulate an email every morning with screenshots of comments or emails or stuff of what people are saying. And there was a woman that said, now keep in mind, the High Five Habit book is not even out yet. Mm-hmm. I've only just shared it on social media. Can't even really get into the deep science, which mm-hmm. we only like scratched at the surface on in our conversation. Mm -hmm. she said that she was at an AA meeting and somebody stood up in the AA meeting and shared the high five habit. You're kidding. No. And said to everybody, you have got to get on the bandwagon with this because we all need to wake up every day and see a human being who is trying and who needs encouragement and support. Wow. And to think that a simple idea backed by science is already going viral and helping people not only help themselves, but help other people by sharing it. Yeah. It is the most just magical and exquisite thing in the world. It's got to feel amazing. Could it be that we are afraid of happiness, as weird as that might sound? If you are pessimistic, afraid, and you look out to the future and you feel gripped, Could you be afraid of happiness? You know, I don't think people are afraid of happiness. I believe because I know that human beings learn and repeat patterns. And when you have something that's not working, you have a pattern that's broken. I don't think you're afraid of being happy. I think that if you are constantly pessimistic or afraid or negative, a couple things could be going on. Number one, um, this is probably a pattern that you learned somewhere, whether you learned it from your parents or your caregivers or the people that you hang out with are negative, or you work in an environment that are negative, or you live with people are negative. That kind of outlook is contagious. You can catch negativity. And so it's probably become a pattern and you don't realize it. The second thing, that this could be, is it could be an issue of self-worth. It's not that you are afraid of happiness. It's that you believe you don't deserve it because you have low self-worth. Or the third thing is that sadness, pessimism, negativity could become your identity, that you get a lot of mileage out of being sad and negative. You get attention from it. You get safety from it. Because as weird as it sounds, We crave the things that are familiar more than anything else. It goes back to patterns. If you're used to being sad, if you're used to being pessimistic, if you were raised in that kind of environment, it's familiar to you. And so you may not even know what does it feel like to be happy and optimistic? Well, here's the good news. All of the researchers on happiness have determined that when you're born, 40% of your happiness level is preset by genetics. That means 60% of your happiness is determined by the little things you do. And even if you were raised by pessimistic people, even if your identity has become kind of like the Eeyore of the crowd, wah, 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 even if you're used to it, there are small things that you can do to bump up your level of happiness. And what I implore you to do is to take this seriously because you can bump up your happiness level. You can become a more optimistic person. How do you do it? Well, there are some simple things that you can do. If you were to simply start exercising every day, that would go a long way. If you were to upgrade your friend group, and by up, I mean you up it to people that have an uplifting attitude. Hang out with more positive people. Follow positive people online and it'll start to rub off on you. Learn about optimism. Optimism is not looking at a shit sandwich and telling yourself it's going to be delicious. 
optimism is saying, well, um, I'm holding a shit sandwich, but I know based on what I do next and based on how I look at things, I can improve the sandwich that I'm holding tomorrow. It's about your belief that your thoughts matter and what you do matters, that you can have a positive impact on a negative situation. I mean, just look at the world around us. There are people taking action right now because the situation that we have in the United States is so negative and violent when it comes to racism and the discrimination against black men, women, and children. And people are taking action and they believe, this is optimism that you are seeing. That's, that's at the heart of a social change movement, the belief that your thoughts and your actions matter and can create a better world in this instance. And I believe that to be true. And so optimism, optimism is a skill you can learn. Happiness is something that you can impact. If you uh, want to take on something simple, get up when the alarm rings, exercise first thing in the morning, surround yourself with positive people, and every single day, force yourself to take one small action toward a goal or a dream that you have, and you will see your optimism and your happiness start to rise. But I think the biggest takeaway of all around pessimism is fear, is if you're used to feeling that way, it's a pattern, and it's a pattern that you need to break. Because right on the other side of that broken pattern is a life that is a whole lot more fulfilling positive and happy. And today's coffee talk is all about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And I'm sure you've heard that statement, right? Feel the fear. And the thing that I want to talk to you about today is that there is not only a lot of inspiration behind that statement, feel the fear, but there's also a lot of science behind it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that if you want to get through and break through your fears that are holding you back, you're going to need to learn to feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, you know, yesterday, I also want to just say that we talked about, um, oh no, it wasn't yesterday. Was it yesterday? Did we go live yesterday? I'm having a hard time uh, remembering what's going on in my life because I've been on the road uh, since Sunday. I'm now in Miami. Yesterday, we talked about living your passion and a lot of you were confused about where to turn in your life if you don't know um, how to live with more passion. A lot of you keep saying you want to find your passion. And so I want to remind you about the fact that if you missed yesterday's training, it's a really important one about the definition of passion because passion is something that's in you. It's something that you unlock. It's something that you release. It is not something that uh, you go and find outside of you. It's something you tap into inside of you. If you missed that training, make sure you go to Facebook or go to YouTube and um, you can watch that training in full. It's a super, super, super important one. But today we're going to be talking about feel the fear because what you're going to learn today is that we tend to think about fear as something that's up here, you know, that the fears are all in our heads. Well, the truth is your body feels fear and remembers fear and senses fear way before your mind does. And the reason why I want to talk to you about this is because as many of you know, we have a brand new audiobook that just launched with Audible Originals. So Audible Originals is an imprint inside of Audible. We are a major partner of Audible's and we just released a brand new audiobook. It's their number one new release on Audible called Take Control of Your Life, How to Silence Fear and win the mental game. And there were some unbelievable things that I learned and that my team learned and that we're now sharing with you in doing that project. So Take Control of Your Life isn't your typical audiobook. It's not me just reading a book that I wrote. What Take Control of Your Life is, is Take Control of Your Life is a live coaching and takeaway program that's 10 hours long. And so there are six people that you meet when you listen to Take Control of Your Life and they have fears, just like you have fears, fears that are holding them back, just like you have fears that hold you back, fears that impact your life in a negative way. And we go 
session by session for six sessions. You listen to the coaching session. You hear about somebody else's fear. You hear me coaching this person live. And then I spend like 45 minutes unpacking the entire coaching session for you. And on top of it, you guys, there's a 55 page workbook that our team designed that goes along as a companion to this audiobook. And you don't even need to buy the audiobook to get the workbook or to get the takeaways because I'm giving you the takeaways for free here on our live stream. So if you want the audiobook, just go to melrobbins.com slash take control and you can download the audiobook. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to talk to you about the session that we did with Heather in Take Control of Your Life. And it's a really incredible um, session because Heather um, is held back at work because what happens is when she has to have a really difficult conversation, when there's something that she wants to talk to her boss about, when there's a conflict with one of her colleagues, do you ever have a conflict with your colleagues at work? Ever feel like you work in a toxic work environment? Well, this is something that you need to understand. Sometimes the toxicity in your work environment is about the other people. And sometimes the toxicity in your work environment or in your life environment or your friend environment is about stored memories in your body from your childhood. I know it's crazy stuff because the saying, feel the fear and do it anyway, it's true because your body feels situations that set you, uh, that put you in a state of being afraid before your mind catches up and starts thinking about what you're afraid of. And so one of the key takeaways from Take Control, and one of the things that I want to teach you today, is that if you start to tune into your body, and you start to notice the signals that your body is sending to you in your day-to-day -day life, signals like butterflies in your stomach, signals like feeling a rush of energy up to your neck, signals like your armpit sweating, signals like your hands getting sweaty, signals that your body is stepping and noticing a situation that reminds it of your past. Learning how to read those signals that, oh my God, here goes my body. My body is starting to recognize that this is a situation that puts me on edge. Recognizing those signals first and slowing the body response down before your brain starts to go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That is a critical skill in taking control of your life. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.